Welcome to Twit This Week in Tech. I'm Devendra Hardwar, a senior editor at Engadget. This week, we're joined by Scott Stein from CNET, Glenn Fleischman, and Alex Lindsay. We're diving into the recent bill that could potentially uh, ban TikTok in the US. We also talk about the state of social media and what we like the most, and um, you know, maybe what we do or don't want from an Apple car and CarPlay. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. You're watching Twit This Week in Tech, episode 971, recorded March 17th, 2024. The Element of Chaos. This episode of This Week in Tech is brought to you by NetSuite. Once your business gets to a certain size, the cracks start to emerge. There are just too many manual processes to keep track of. If that's where you are, you should know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and 1. I better explain. 37,000. That's the number of businesses who have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, HR, and more. What about 25? Well, believe it or not, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because <laughs> your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance. And it's absolutely free. NetSuite.com slash twit. That's NetSuite. Dot com slash twit to get your own KPI checklist. NetSuite.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. I'm senior editor Devinder Hardwar from Engadget. I'm filling in for Leo Laporte, who's taking a well-deserved break. And we're going to be talking about all sorts of stuff, but mainly TikTok and the latest government moves around that. And joining me today, I think, is uh, one of the most interesting panels in tech. Just people who have so many talents. We've got Glenn Fleischman. How's it going, Glenn? I'm doing fabulous. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for joining us. Like, I, I've been reading and listening to you forever, Glenn. I also know you are a, a typesetter. You, you've been working in type forever, right? That's right. I was, uh, I was one of the last people trained as a typesetter in the, uh, in the 80s using phototype setting equipment. And, and somehow I find myself in the future. It's like a, a man out of time. Awesome. Awesome. And you are also currently trying to kickstart a book right now, right? That's right. It's a, it's a book about the history of uh, newspaper comics production and reproduction from an artist's pen all the way through to appearing on paper. And uh, we'll have never, told, never told before stories, stories never told before, I should say, including how a week of Doonesbury in 1973 <laughs> never ran because John Ehrlichman resigned. <laughs> okay. Exciting. What's the name of the book in the Kickstarter? It's uh, called How Comics Were Made, and it's live on Kickstarter, and you can also find it at howcomicswermade.inc. That's .inc. Awesome. And we've got Scott Stein, editor-at-large at CNET. Hey, Scott. How's it going? Hey, it's good to see you, Devendra. Good um, to see you. Glad to yeah. be on here. Yeah, this will, this will be fun. We've also got Alex Lindsay, head of ops at O90. Hey, Alex. How's it going? Hey. It's good to be here. Good to, good to chat with you, too. Every time I see O90, I'm thinking, go 90 which is the the Verizon thing. And I was a part, I was, we were working as part of Verizon when that thing launched. And that was a fun thing. That was a, I had a yeah, just the, a crazy idea. The owner of the company is, is Mark East. And so it's mm -hmm. East. Oh, uh, 090 is the East, uh, East <laughs> oh. media. So that, that's, that's where it comes from. Do you guys remember Go90? Do you remember what the, the pitch for Go90 was? I remember it Go90, was, but I can't remember what, I can't remember the details. The, it was in Verizon uh, territory. It, well, it's or one of those things players. where when you're in a company and you watch your parent company just doing the dumbest thing possible, and <laughs> it was called Go90 because it was, um, oh, when people are watching video on their phones, they're going to turn their portrait-facing phone landscape. <sighs> you're going to Go90, oh, baby, to watch right. video on mobile. Oh, because everybody right. wants to do that, right? Yeah, because you can watch Quibi that way or Quibi. Sorry, Quibi. 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 That's what I was thinking about Quibi all of a sudden. But the, but it's a landscape play. It was a landscape. <laughs> right. Right. It Play was for the, the phone? You know, I held both. out I held out for a long time. Like I'm like, I'm gonna I, you know, this really should be sixteen by nine. This should, and then there was some point where I'm where someone put something sixteen by nine into TikTok or something like that. And I was like, 
why are they doing this? This is really this hard. Is like it's, it's hard to turn it sideways. <laughs> Apparently there's a new trend. I didn't discover this, but I read about it in Ryan Broderick's uh, Garbage Day newsletter. Love he it. Said, Love it. Yeah. He said the Air, uh, Avatar Last Airbender, the film or the live action thing is shot, even though it's, you know, correct proportions for television, it's shot where all of the action is in the center TikTok frame. For clipping, huh. and he said another movie came out, and he was looking at all the previews for it. Or I don't think he'd seen it yet. It was the same thing. There's no action that doesn't occur in that hmm. plane. So while they're shooting, they may have a frame on it. I mean, it makes sense too. Obviously, the way things are shared, you know. but not for what for just for viral clip sharing. Would you do that? Yeah, it's I don't know. I'm curious if it plays out over time, or it's just that a would weird, be. I, yeah, I, I find the fact the fact that we're changing all these different formats. You know, one of the things we noticed uh, a little while ago is AJR the band started releasing their videos at like one, four, three, seven, you know, like it wasn't, it wasn't huh. quite one IMAX is one, four, three. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, but it wasn't quite one, four, three either. Um, but it's, it is this weird kind of squarish, but not totally square format. Right. It looks great. Like, like, you know, and, mm -hmm. and what's interesting that we, one of the things we found with the Apple vision pro is that that format looks way better on the vision pro than uh, two, <sighs> three, five or 16 by nine because the way your field of view works is you see a lot up and down, but you don't see yeah. as much in the Vision Pro side to side. Yeah. And so that kind of yeah. squarish uh, format tends to actually play out really well on the on the Vision Pro. That's why the IMAX app actually looks tremendous. Scott, like you played around with that, I remember, right? Like the, it looks yeah. like, it feels like you're in an IMAX theater because you get the vertical kind of scale there. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. And I, I feel like I'm getting frustrated by some of the trying to get a movie screen to fit in the perfect way when watching like it works but then i i keep wanting to adjust my i want to fine tune to you know kind oh, of oh yeah you know i and put, put it I, can, I think i want those theaters but i never want to use the, the like the the apple one lets you sit in the front or the back yeah. or the middle or whatever and i'm like just pop the window up what i do is i go in and i get the like i usually joshua tree at night or whatever but i put yeah. it up as the general background and then i put then I put the screen on top of it so that I can to exactly what Scott's saying. So I can move the screen to where I want it. I don't want to mm -hmm, put it yeah. in a theater. It's not quite big enough. <laughs> it's not perfect. Like, but I want the distance. I want the sense of distance, distance, but then yeah. I want the fine tuning. And yeah. then I feel like I'm stuck in like three different forms, which I'm also usually go 90 ing when I'm like lying down. I feel like go 90, by the way, feels mm -hmm. like a, a, a personal. I've not touched a vision pro yet. Not out of principle. Ooh. I just haven't even done it. You should, so, I mean, for, for everybody listening, you can, you can I sign up for a free no demo at an Apple store and it is, it is worth 30 minutes of your time because I think, I mean, Scott, like you wrote a long review. I wrote a freaking long review of it too. Like we, we've yeah. put so many thoughts of that thing out there. It is so fascinating. Even if you don't think, you know, it's something you'll I, ever buy. Oh, it is yeah. one of the most I, like, yeah, fascinating things I've ever seen. Yeah. I think that for me, that the interesting thing wasn't the first 20 minutes. It was a week or two into it. Mm -hmm. And I, because I use the Quest a lot, I've been using the Quest since it was an Oculus and I'll yeah. oftentimes have it on for half an hour a day or something like that. Doing, oh, wow. yeah. I like doing Supernatural, which is the boxing thing. And, then, and, and, and I still yeah. like Robo Recall, which is in my, I like just ripping uh, Android's heads off. Anyway, so the, um, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, the, so I, the, you know, kind of is a great way to kind of pass some time. But I noticed that with the Quest, I put it on. And I go and play those. And those are great. Both of those are great products. But then I take it off and put it down. Like, okay, yeah. I've, I've done the thing that I was going to do. On the single, Vision Pro. very single use. Yeah. It is. On the Vision Pro, I get in and I'm kind of fiddling around. I'm texting some folks and I do this yep. thing. You know, and, and, and I think that one of the things that really pays off where you can kind of tell people who like the Vision Pro are real often, not always, <laughs> often real Apple people who have mm -hmm. committed to all the Apple, the ecosystem. Like I have... 600 videos on apple tv so when i put it on there's all these videos no now there's all these 3d videos that i didn't even, you know that just are now available and now there's all of these other videos and so i can sit there i have lots to watch and i suddenly what i realized with the vision pro and again the wait first 20 minutes first 30 minutes you're like wow this is really heavy and then after you know i don't know i don't think about that anymore mm -hmm. um the but i noticed that it's like there's been a couple times where like holy smokes i've been here for three hours you yeah. know like i've you know like i've yeah. been you know, sitting here doing something. And again, it's like, I stop and start and do things and move around. And, 
And, uh, and so it's just a really, I, uh, that's the thing that I find is that I, when people say, what are you doing on the Apple vision pro? Like I, if you told me what, what are you doing on the quest? I can always tell you what I'm doing on the right, quest right. on the vision pro. I'm like, ah, I'm kind of hanging out. Just like, kind of like, living, just kinda exactly. kinda living yeah. in, in um, spatial computing. Like one thing I, I love is the blowing up the Mac, you know, display to like an ungodly size. And sometimes <laughs> I just sit and write and do that with a ton of windows around me, but I'm so focused on, on the work and the research yeah. and stuff I'm doing. It's kind of wild. Well, actually this is a good topic like good good to talk about like all these legacy um video things and also what uh, the vision pro is doing with video too because uh, the big topic this week is tiktok and everything happening around that and apparently there's a really fast moving bipartisan push to approve the bill um that could potentially ban tiktok in the u.s or at least get it passing through the house we still don't know what's going to happen with the senate we do know that uh president biden has said if this thing passes uh congress he will sign it and specifically, they're saying um, this is basically a, they're calling it a, div, a divi, uh, sorry a divestment bill. Like if um, it's basically to push ByteDance to sell TikTok um, in the U.S. Basically, uh, they have 180 days to do that, or it'll be delisted from app stores. Uh, they're not. They're saying it's not a TikTok ban, but it sure does sound like a ban to me. Um, I feel like this has been a topic at Twit for the past couple of years. I think even since uh, it started with Trump, but I also know like this has come and gone, but it seems like this is the closest it's ever been. And it's kind of wild to me that there is such like bipartisan support for well, getting rid of TikTok at this it, point. It, it, I'm just wondering, what do you, what do you guys think about this? At this TikTok point? didn't help themselves, you know, yep. so the, the concern, the concern is that is not really about data. I mean, some people are talking about data, but the real concern is influence and, yep. And the influence can be both overt influence, which is get everybody to do something at one time, but also subtle. The And people say, well, it's not doing a very good job. There was a couple articles that were, we were reading that it's not doing a very good job if, if the idea is to make China more popular, but that may not be the goal. The goal may be to waste people's time and make them not trust their own government or their own media very much. Sure. You know, like, so it, you, we think that, that, that there's, that someone's going to do something right on the nose, but if you were smart, you wouldn't do that. You would mm -hmm. do it in a very subtle way. You, and you'd move the needle a couple percentage points one way or the other. And that would be enough to affect, you know, people over time, mm -hmm. you know, you have to think about it in the long term. So that's the concern. I'm, by the way, I love TikTok. I watch TikTok. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, like, so I'm not, I just want to make sure we're clear. <laughs> I don't think that they should get rid of TikTok, but I'm just saying that I understand. And then what TikTok did to make it, uh, to make this hard is they told everyone to go call their congressperson. They did yeah. exactly, they exactly the what they were worried about. Yeah. And of course, everyone's like, okay, let's vote. You know, because mm -hmm. they just, they did the scary thing that everyone was afraid that, that China would do. Mm -hmm. And we do have to remember that China, the China's relationship with its companies are not the same as our relationship with our companies. You know, like, you know, uh, you know not, not our, but our government's relationship. Our government's mm -hmm. relationship with with companies is usually tenuous at best. I mean, they both kind of put up with each other and don't really like each other most of the time. In China, the government's pretty embedded into what the what large companies like ByteDance are doing. Mm -hmm. And so there is a kind of a valid concern of, of those types of things. So I, so I, I again, as a TikTok lover, I don't yep. make a lot of, I don't make a lot of TikToks myself, but I watch a lot of other people's work. Um, and I think that you do see hints of what could happen. Innocuous hints, I mean, but, some some woman in the UK decided to start dancing to David Gray's Babylon, and now it's everywhere, <laughs> you know, and, and showing up back on radio, you know, because because you know someone literally after a hangover decided to sit, to, to to recover by doing Babylon once, and that's the kind of ripple effect that I think mm -hmm. that they're afraid of, but in a nefarious way. If it happened, you can see the kind of influence that TikTok sure. can exude in that process. And you're specifically talking about, um, so TikTok within the app sent a push notification to you, uh, U.S. users saying, hey, call yeah. your congressperson, type in your zip code And they just here. overwhelmed, I mean, they yeah. overwhelmed the systems of all these congresspeople. And that was exactly what they're worried that China is going to do to them. It's a, so it was, it was a per, perhaps not the best move because uh, oh. there was reporting saying that some, some people who are like leaning maybe yeses on the bill went definitely exactly. yes after seeing this. Even though, I'll point out, Uber and a lot of companies um, have done very similar things within their apps. Like call your congressperson because your city is trying to regulate us out of business. They just weren't as effective. Yeah.
they weren't as effective, but they weren't China. And I feel like that's the big yeah. scary thing yeah. here. But I, Scott, like, I don't, yeah. I don't have TikTok installed on any of my devices, and I encourage my children not to install mm -hmm. it either. Mm -hmm. And um, I am, uh, I am not a xenophobic person, um, mm -hmm. but I also do not trust China's policies in any way. And I think companies doing business in China, whether they're Chinese companies or companies that are based elsewhere, suffer from. Uh, both secret laws and a lack of a, a trustable court system that mm -hmm. works in a, at least a ostensibly fair way and from government uh, mandates that require that they adhere to rules that are far beyond what we see in most democratic nations uh, in terms of oversight and involvement. And you see this just constantly preemptive uh, self-censorship and censorship or actions based on uh, what has to happen uh, because you're doing business in China or you're a Chinese mm -hmm, citizen mm -hmm. and the reach that China wants is so huge. So I will not defend uh, Facebook or Twitter or any other social network that's U.S. based or based in another country for how they're dealing with moderation, dealing with material that targets minors, personal information. There's no argument there that TikTok is somehow magically worse, but I think they're operating under mm -hmm. a uh, they're operating under a regime, like both like you know, regime a regulatory regime, but also a regime that exercises more direct control. So. I've always felt dubious about what TikTok could be, despite whatever the motivations are of the company um, mm -hmm. itself. And so I don't want to blame, I would never blame the people of China for something like this, but it's easy to say the Chinese government, uh, TikTok could further the goals of the Chinese government in terms of, of their extensive interest in espionage and breaking into systems and gathering information. That, you know, China's done an incredibly effective job of being a 21st century, uh, you know, cyber, uh, I don't know, whatever, like multi- <laughs> phasic warfare against uh, mm -hmm. in a, sort of a cold cyber war, right? That That's they try to seize themselves yeah. Yeah. existentially existentially threatened by everyone else in the world. And some mm -hmm. things they're doing, I think, are very positive in terms of trying to establish Chinese businesses, people buying in China from Chinese companies, and other things are outwardly negative to the rest of the world. I don't think TikTok is per se that, but there's nothing that protects us mm -hmm. from it. Um, and where Facebook, when subject to regulation, I believe has to, you know, does adhere to it ultimately or is or is under some kind of stricture that they do because they're doing business in company in countries that have different uh, reliable judicial systems say, and so forth. Gotcha. And I do want to be clear. It seems like um, the politicians supporting this bill are saying, yeah, they are worried about the, da the data that China gets access to because of TikTok. They're worried about this sort of like undue influence. Um, as we've kind of like hinted at here, like other social media companies get access to the same sort of data. They just don't have the same sort of influence well, and, on us. They're certainly not owned by China. I feel like that's the big scary boogeyman right. to me. And, it's and, just and, like China. And, yeah. and to be fair, we have our own propaganda machine. Yes. We have our own, like our government does, you know, like we're not, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be like innocent lilies here. No, 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 but we, I don't want to boast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll fight but, back but what, on the both sides, which is that there's a distinct difference between the way in which China requires companies there to secretly provide information with no oversight, with no free uh, uh, journal, you know, journalistic entities available. So when things like at and involvement in mm -hmm. uh, alleged involvement, I don't know if it was ever proven involvement <laughs> in providing information from their, their uh, core phone network to government agencies and so forth, that gets mm -hmm. investigated, exposed, some action turn out to be illegal. They get overturned. Companies here respond. Google starts encrypting data end to end between data centers. Companies in China have no ability mm -hmm. or recourse to do any of that. Right. But I'm saying as, as a projection company, I mean, you know, our government and, and a lot of things project a lot of things into a lot of countries. You know, Absolutely. We, we do a lot of those things. It's just that China is an adversary. Like we just have to yeah. remember that we don't view China as our, <laughs> yeah. you know, like if, if the UK was doing TikTok, we'd be like, ah, you know, they're having a good time. You know, but China is is specifically, you know, China and Russia are our two largest adversaries, China probably being the most serious adversary to the United States. And so in the same way that China has turned off a lot of our social networks there because they don't want to be affected by it. Uh, the United States is not not worried about TikTok being influential. It's worried about our primary adversary having a thumb on the ability to move ideas. You know, and I think that I don't again, I don't necessarily agree with banning it i do think that you know making the threat of divest you know to, that they have to divest i think the chances of it going away are very very low sure. um the uh you know i think that the chances of this passing the senate are probably less than 50 percent. the chances of them not divesting if it did get signed is probably less than 10 percent. so it's probably not a not a high probability this is actually going to happen what it does do is it pushes lots of users out of tiktok um so the tiktokers are 
uh, now, like they're all promoting their YouTube channels. You know, like I'm also on YouTube and I'm also on, you know, so just rattling the saber is enough to kind of weaken the the system. And it also puts China a little bit on, you know, basically reminds them that we're looking. <laughs> like we're rattling the saber, we're banging on a, on a, on a, we're, we're banging on the pipe. Like we could come after you, you know, and, and I think that there's a little bit of that, which, which again, scares some folks. And, and again, the many TikTokers, the first time this happened, many of them started building their, their, um, what is now a very large following on YouTube. Yeah. So, so the thing is, is that they're, they, every time we do this, there's this huge wash of both uh, creators and followers of those creators going to primarily YouTube. I think YouTube's the primary benefactor of, of, um, of these kinds of uh, interactions uh, because of shorts is a very natural thing for them to go to. And it's a little less sticky. It's, it's easier for them to just kind of push people towards as opposed to, and, and I think Instagram and Facebook both benefited as well. Gotcha. But I think YouTube is probably the primary benefit. I think th this is a big topic, by the way, and I want to come back to this, but let's go to Leo to hear for a word from our sponsor. Hey, Devendra, can I interrupt for just one moment? I want to tell you a little bit about Panoptica. This episode is brought to you by Panoptica. Panoptica, Cisco's cloud application security solution, provides end-to-end -end life cycle protection for cloud-native application environments. It empowers organizations to safeguard their APIs, serverless functions, containers, and Kubernetes environments. Panoptica ensures comprehensive cloud security, compliance, and monitoring at scale, offering deep visibility, contextual risk assessments, and actionable remediation insights for all your cloud assets. Powered by graph-based technology, Panoptica's attack path engine prioritizes and offers dynamic remediation for vulnerable attack vectors, helping security teams quickly identify and remediate potential risks across cloud infrastructures. A unified cloud-native security platform minimizes gaps from multiple solutions, providing centralized management and reducing non-critical vulnerabilities from fragmented systems. Panoptica utilizes advanced attack path analysis, root cause analysis, and dynamic remediation techniques to reveal potential risks from an attacker's viewpoint. This approach identifies new and known risks, emphasizing critical attack paths and their potential impact. This insight's unique and difficult to glean from other sources of security telemetry, such as network firewalls. Get more information on Panoptica's website, panoptica.app. More details on Panoptica's website, panoptica.app. All right, let's get back to Twit. Devendra Hardawar, take it away. Well, thank you, Leo. Uh, back to TikTok. Um, I've been, you know, I, I've had a couple of chances to chat with the great documentary director, Alex Gibney, and he did a, he did a movie almost a decade ago that's basically about China being the center of cyber cold war. You know, and that that seems like the thing I think um, people in government and politicians are also really worried about. And us on the ground, we don't really think about that much. You know, we will occasionally see um, companies or certain types of infrastructure or hospitals get attacked. And sometimes those are tied to agents of the Chinese government. But beyond that, it seems like there's no like direct, uh, you know, direct conflict happening between our two countries. Scott, I'm wondering, um, what, yeah. do, what do you think of this entire situation? I know I've been listening to all of you thinking mm -hmm. about this and it's like, you know, when TikTok first launched, I thought it was weird. And I yeah. was, you know, I felt like what what's going on here. <laughs> then like a lot of time went by. It's it's odd to me. I don't know the time uh, frames. And, and one things, question for you is when TikTok launched or when they bought Musical.ly. <laughs> like, ah. So oh, yeah. so that's the that's the other thing, because it's a different because Musical.ly had its own culture, which still permeates, you know, TikTok. Yeah. Or something. But I think now, obviously, it has a it has a has a lot of power sure and it's it's very popular and people are finding things useful about it too so i don't know the timing on you know like when does it when are people decide okay this is now a threat because i feel like that, sh that should have been perceived like then all along but you know that's like that, that's what's a little strange to me that you know that this was like that now this is taking action the problem is now that like it, maybe it is because it has its power but people are also used to using it so right. We're in the midst of this big social media fatigue zone and falling out all over the place. And like on a functional level, it's probably one of the least problematic and that, uh, uh, that are out there. I, I will introduce a, a conspiracy theory for you that's starting to build up is that <laughs> yeah, the okay. timing of this is remarkably close to TikTok not making a deal with UMG. 
Mm. So Universal Media Media Group, yeah. uh, you know, it's there's a growing number of people that think that wow, that was you know like the the timing of the of the ban and the breakdown of of an, with the largest the largest company in the music industry. Um, you know, may not be completely disconnected. But and that's, that's, I would say the only, there's a couple things there, but one of them is that, you know, surely if that happened, it would make TikTok uh, much less relevant. And so that, that problem takes care of itself. But I think uh, one thing we haven't discussed before, and I think it's, I mean, most people realize this, but I'm surprised when I find someone who doesn't, which is that part of the Cold War aspect is that TikTok's mm -hmm. available here in the United States and in other countries. It's not available in China. And that most, uh, I think, is it, are there any American based or European based? social networks available in China anymore? I mean, Facebook isn't, Twitter so. no. isn't. Yeah. Right, so there's an asymmetry, which is usually you yeah. assume there's something, uh, there's a Cold War happening when there's no bombs dropping and there's an asymmetry in information availability. So that is one issue. And it's one thing that's been used as a cudgel too, is if TikTok is so great and it's not dangerous, why doesn't China allow it in its own country? And, and it has an analog mm -hmm. there, but there is that, that gets us into the whole censorship thing, the tightness by which China controls its citizens, controls the information they see. Internet access to. in general, like kids right. can only, they can only play online games for a certain amount of hours every school day, things it, like that. So it sounds like a dream to American parents sometimes, I, but then you're like, but what, what are we required oh, to allow that? Yes. Yeah. I'm <laughs> here right now because I spent I way too much time online when I was yeah, a teenager, me too. you know, and <laughs> that's, that's what it gets you. Not like an army, you know, not a nation of uh, would be engineers maybe. Right. So Absolutely. I don't know. There, there's and, give and take there. I want, I want to point something out too. There's a lot of like pushback against this, including from Mike Masnick of TechDirt, who's often here on Twit and a great guest love and always Mike. somebody I love to listen to. And he wrote a great piece uh, titled once more with feeling banning <laughs> TikTok is unconstitutional and won't do to deal with any actual threats. And that is kind of where I'm coming down on it. It does. Yes. China does ban all other social networks. China does completely lock down what its citizens can see. I don't know if like, that's not necessarily like a lesson we should be, we should be taking, <laughs> right. you know, from them. Like it, it seems like a bad precedent for us to start going down this path. And, um, we we got to make this clear. Like all the things we're worried about that TikTok is doing, getting access to our data, influencing the population. That is something every single social network, um, especially like the U S founded ones are all responsible for. It was not 2016 is not yeah. that long ago when we were reading about like the Russian influence on Twitter and you know how that impacted that election too. Well, so is yeah. this an illegal taking also? Is like there an argument he made that and not always unconstitutional mm -hmm. potentially, but that this is actually, it's a wealth transfer from yes. a Chinese company to some apparent, like Steve Mnuchin has put in, a, I guess is working on a proposal to take over TikTok. And it's like, well, okay, so the money, it's going to lose a lot of value because the algorithm is not part of the assets. The Chinese wouldn't allow the algorithm to be exported, or even maybe though it's being used. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So there's an argument made there, but at some level, this is, you know, the, the argument from the, the uh, uh, classical conservative perspective would be this is a taking of property without just compensation in addition to any constitutional arguments mm -hmm. but it's china therefore, right. therefore bad therefore right. it's mine now uh, to me that feels a uh, real just really wild um axios had a good piece talking about the potential valuations um they're saying tiktok is estimated to be worth 100 billion dollars if it does somehow include the algorithm um or 40 billion dollars if it doesn't which makes me think who who will act, who could buy that is another big tech company and and that's, and that's not, the other problem. Yeah. I think the algorithm might have been important now, but I think a lot of people have a pretty good sense of how that algorithm works. Um, and I don't think it's as magical mm. as it sounds. I think that there is something that's magical. I, I spend a lot of time analyzing sure, these, sure, these things sure, for, sure. for creators. And and one of the things that we look at is that that there's a distinct difference between TikTok and other ones. And it's the, it's the nature of sharing content between users. Yes. So there is an incredible, like if you use somebody else's thing on YouTube, you get immediately, you, you can be either flagged, demonetized. Whereas on TikTok, people put things up with the intention of you taking from them, mm -hmm. you know? And so you'll see something that gets popular. It might have a quarter million, not a quarter million viewers, a quarter million videos created with the same audio sample. 
And, and so the thing is, is, you know, like this David Gray one that I talked, I just, I study things like that. So I watch them and I just see, okay, where is this going? And how is it, how many, it's like the last time I looked, it was like 4,500 videos have been made with the same sample, you know, and, and David Gray shows up on some of them. Cause I think he's, he's as mystified as everybody else. I mean, he's had a, this hit was like 25 <laughs> years ago and suddenly everybody's playing it, you know? And so, so the, uh -huh. the interesting thing is, and I'm going to propagate it here, you know, it's, it's Babylon, by the way, Babylon is the song. It's a good song. Mm -hmm. It's a good song. Not a great song. <laughs> not a song, not a super memorable song, but man, it's a going. So anyway, and the same thing, you know, the, the Fleetwood Mac saw that with, you know, with one of their songs. And, and so the, so the thing is, is that there's a nature of sharing between users at TikTok that allow them to have a unified experience among themselves. Um, there was a point where the, you know, there was a Nick Cage movie where he's laughing, Manai, or the, the other, um, you know, there's back and there's back and forth. And people get to show what their own life, how their own life applies to the exact same clip. And they get to share that over and over. I mean, literally there were th th tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of videos of people saying, this is what it's like in a meeting, or this is what it's like in here. This is what it's like with my wife. This is what it's like, you know, like whatever it is. And that is what's really powerful, I think, mm -hmm. about TikTok. You're absolutely it, right. Yeah. And I don't yeah. think it's necessarily the algorithm. I think that they've built a culture. I mean, I think the algorithm was important at the beginning and it still is, but it's a pretty, I think, it's not that complicated what they're doing, you know? And mm -hmm. so, um, but what, what is complicated is to build a culture of 170 million people who are believe in this culture and use it all the time, you know? And so it's, I think that that's the thing that, that makes it valuable still. It's pure remix culture, you know? And I think that's it something really is. that, that to me has always been such a, such a, you know, strong part of the internet and what makes the internet work so well. I mean, it's part of retweeting on Twitter and, you know, and adding stuff to it. Like that was a big part of the success there. I do want to point out, like we're talking about, this is a successful mobile video platform and we are just walking through a graveyard of failed ones, right? Go 90, Verizon's go 90, Quibi. I talked to Jeffrey Katzenberg before Quibi launched. And part of my discussion was like, what the hell are you doing? Nobody <laughs> wants this. Nobody wants to pay for mobile video. YouTube is here for free. What are yeah. you doing, Jeffrey Katzenberg? They raised $2 billion for that thing. Brilliant. And so many like US companies have tried to do mobile video and failed. Vine was great. Vine was succeeding. And then Twitter killed it because they didn't fully see the potential of it. And Twitter was not making any money at the time either. So they probably couldn't keep it running. But so much of what TikTok makes TikTok work is the power of Vine, right? Short videos, short, easily shareable videos, but also that remix culture. And Instagram can't do that. Um, Facebook can't do that. Everyone's racing to catch up. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, like, and that, even, that is even, the thing. Yeah. Even YouTube who does shorts, I mean, and mm -hmm. shorts can be fairly successful. I mean, shorts right. are a pretty powerful platform on their own. Post TikTok but response by YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, but and and definitely, um, uh, but they don't have that remix culture in mm -hmm. in YouTube. It's very still very protective, and that's their Achilles heel when trying to compete with TikTok. Mm -hmm. And they don't serve up in the same way. Like I mean, to me, like the ability, the easiness of creating and of viewing, like it's the easiness too. Like you know, I feel like when I'm using uh, TikTok, that you know, it's not a hard thing to bring in that stuff. In fact, it's designed yeah. to bring in the yep. things that are meant to be shared. And that's like the ease you have with the text-based social media app, you know, that you're going to do that. Uh, that's, those are the tools that exactly that need to be there. And then the discoverability of the stuff that people have made as a response is easy, you know, so then, you know, like on, on YouTube, that's not. And, and I think that's like that, even though I don't like using TikTok all that much, mm -hmm. I already see when I do that, that stuff is a lot easier to kind of follow through the threads and, and work with. And it's just not like that on Instagram. It, I'll, I'll tell you, there's a, there's a great meme we missed, which is that that could have happened, which is that you remember the, uh, there's a Star Trek next generation episode in which there's an addictive game that everyone puts on their head and they can't escape from. Right. So oh, yeah. that's TikTok. Well, Ashley Judd appears in that episode. Ashley Judd was planning to, at one point to run for Senate. She did not, but imagine if Ashley Judd were in the Senate and arguing that TikTok should be banned. There'd just be constant Star Trek memes of her from that episode with the, uh, the goggles on, but we missed that opportunity because you know, a, I mean, we're, no we're not geeky enough for this. We're not, <laughs> we're not geeky enough for that meme. Um, there was a great piece at 404 media, a site that I love by Jason Kobler. That's called the U S wants to ban TikTok for the sins of every social media company, <laughs> strong title. And also yep. true. I think that is also very true. Of course, there's all the stuff we're talking about with China, but do you, 
TikTok compared to what other social media companies are doing? Are you guys like, well, how do you feel about that? Because to me, it feels like the real way to allay our fears about what TikTok could do is to pass a national, you know, data protection law or something like to deal with this on a level that covers everything and not just the thing from China. I know. I think it's I an mean, easier I, I, thing to solve too. Yeah. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I, and I think that, uh, I, I'm my biggest complaint about social media in general is that it's just a big waste of time, you know, Absolutely. and and so it's just it, it just it just as a um, just if that's all TikTok did was waste Americans time while Chinese continue to go to school, <laughs> it might be an effective tool to to undermine the entire country because of the amount of time being spent on it. Like, for instance, I, I feel like I feel guilty watching TikTok for time, not for anything else but I don't, I don't like biking in the morning. So I find that if I, the only time I get to watch TikTok is when I'm biking. Like ah. I, I've, I've set up this rule. So I have to be on my exercise <laughs> bike before I turn TikTok on. And so then, so that gets me exercising because I want to get my 30 minutes or 45 minutes of, of TikTok in every day. Um, but, but I think that the, uh, so I, I combine those things, but I, you know, I, I took Facebook off my phone. I took all the meta stuff off my phone, mostly because I realized I got a new phone and I didn't put uh, those on and my battery lasted twice as long. And I was like, I don't know what... I, it's not, it's not a privacy thing or anything else. I was just like, my battery's lasting longer. I'm just going to leave them off. And so, so I don't have any of the meta apps on there. And, and I, Elon Musk has made, uh, has been gracious enough to make X a lot harder to enjoy. So, so I, so it's been really easy for me not to spend as much time in X that I, that I used to spend in Twitter. And so I've been kind of fortunate that these ones, now I still watch I watch a lot of YouTube, mostly on my TV. <laughs> like that's like my primary YouTube television. YouTube on the TV is so good. Yeah. It's yeah. YouTube on the, like it's, I just have it on my Apple TV and I just watch in between YouTube and YouTube exactly. TV. And I mean, that's, that's how I, like I put up with watching movies now. Like I, I was, my, my wife and I go back and forth. She was just like, let's watch a movie. And I'm like, let's watch YouTube. <laughs> and it's not even like good to YouTube. It's like, <laughs> we, I stop. I'm like, let's watch some daily dose. Like the problem is we have to wait for the daily doses to come out because we've watched every <laughs> single daily dose. You know, now we're in, the, we ran out of daily doses. So now we're like one, three, one, four, one, six or something like that. There's some new one that we're still working through, but you know, and, and so the thing is, is that outside, that's the only one that I really spend much time on now, but I've been fortunate enough and there's so much good. I mean, I will say for all the goofy stuff that we watch, I watched, there's a new kid, 18 year old kid putting something on YouTube and it is, it's something like chemistry in 19 minutes. I can't think mm. of the name. It's like wacky scientist or wacky science, I think is the name of the channel. He's been out for like two months. He's got 45,000 followers. Um, I learned more in the first half of that video about chemistry than I did as a sophomore in high school for a whole year. Mm. And it was said more effectively um, and it illustrated better than any of my teachers did. Uh, during that time. And so, you know, that's what I think is the real power of YouTube is that you just get people who get creative about how, and it's got little funny things, you know, it's like, you know, a uh, little funny, like to keep it interesting. And so I think that there are great uses for social media as well. Um, but I think that, um, uh, and so it's not that I don't, I think social media is bad, but I do think that I found that for myself, I had to stop using it so much, you know? And yeah. so now I probably spend less than an hour a day on it. Other than I, I find, I, I yeah. think of this TV. <laughs> I I agree with the take though that like I mean I think the China decision is easy to solve in that you know you can you can make that demand but the bigger question of what social media is still doing and <laughs> what the tangle of all of this ends up becoming and how how any government can sort of be involved in having a say in that I think is how you know we've not been able to solve it and I think social media keeps getting stranger and it will keep getting stranger. The forms will keep getting stranger, like every indication. It's like, so if it's not been solved now, it's, uh, there is a generation maybe that will, you know, learn to become more savvy about what's out there media wise now, I think, but it's not in its final form in, in what, you know, I think as, as how it's going to evolve with AI and, and other tools to remix media as, as we're already seeing, like it's going to become more fluid. And so, um, TikTok's interesting to me, but you know, no, no answers there. It's weird for, for me, the video part, I don't watch a lot of, a lot of video social media. I have no idea why, but I think I know why, because I think it takes time. I think it's the pure time, um, sure. expense yeah. where I, I'm not a big, like 2.0 speed. I should get into doing stuff like that, <laughs> but like, or 1.5, I don't know what 2.0 would do to me, no, but no, like, no, no. <laughs> 3.5 speed. But I think <laughs> like text, I can just kind of scroll through fast. And I, I read all sorts of 
uh, crap in my attempted to curate feeds, but like um, the video, I'll, I'll tend to like want to watch parts of shows or movies or read a book or then, but then I still have so many. So like I, I've not pruned apps from my phone. I have everything. And but there's no need to um, prune apps anymore. That is a 2010 problem. My, right? my thing well, about yeah. pruning like apps is that, that I, yeah. I go from one when I, every time I buy a new phone, I don't move the other phone over. Mm. I just buy the new phone and I reinstall the oh. apps as, as it, as it comes Ooh. up. And so I, I just, because yeah. I, I think I had one, at one point I had like 300 apps on one of my phones and I was like, so I went to the next one and now I have maybe three or four pages of, because it's, it pops into my head like, oh, I think I had an app that did that. And I find it out in a little cloud with a little download. Like, yes. yes, you already, you already got that. But I don't, I put them on organically as I need them, as opposed to, um, you know, leaving them on my phone. So. I, I would say I got to, I got to agree with, uh, Jason Kobler, uh, quite a bit, which is, uh, despite, I mean, like I, you know, I'd voiced my concerns about China at the outset and I, I think those are separate and legitimate, but the fact that, um, it's politically obviously given that there was bipartisan support for this in the house Wild. broad broad bipartisan support it's an election year it's very popular to speak out against china i mean mm -hmm. uh you know one of the one of the things the trump administration if i if i can say a positive thing about the trump administration uh that affected me was they actually challenged china on low-cost shipping from china which costs the u.s postal service on the uh -huh. order of hundreds of millions of dollars a year very obscure thing but very popular with me and some other people because it's a competitive reason it makes the u.s post office less uh solvent because we're subsidizing chinese shipping so there's mm -hmm. you know there's a million issues with china that various people support and some of them completely valid and some are xenophobic and racist and horrible but the idea that china is trying to outcompete the united states because it can't do so let's say legitimately in certain spheres it doesn't legitimately in others this is just yet another area so it's really popular politically to do it it's like it's not popular to say after years of trying and failing to get anything done with Facebook, Twitter, uh, in, you know, Instagram, many of the meta companies and Google related things. Uh, there's been no success there enforcing any regulation that fits within First Amendment parameters and provides uh, some of the safety for particularly for children, but also in a lot of other categories that people actually want. So what's the most popular thing to do? We attack TikTok. It's very popular. Parents, it's one one uh, one weird trick that will get you votes from parents, I guess, is <laughs> attacking TikTok. Well, you know, you know yeah. you're in trouble when Jeff Jackson, who is the representative out of North Carolina, who probably has the largest TikTok following of anyone in Congress and is by far the most effective TikToker on, mm -hmm. in Congress, mm -hmm. When even he votes for the bill, you're like, oh okay. my god! <laughs> <laughs> and then all the TikTokers, like, they, 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 like, you know, like ten thousand people stop following him almost immediately, and because uh, they're they all take it. But he's like, I don't think that the, he just wants it to be sold. Like he, he's like, I don't want TikTok to go away. Obviously, I just want it to be not in Chinese hands. And, that, I, that and again, also, I yeah. yeah while that. I don't agree with it, and I and I would prefer to leave. I think that you let the market do what it's going to do. I don't think that. Um, I think we have to. I actually think that we're building towards a culture that doesn't trust anything, which I think is actually pretty healthy. Um, you know, I think that people, I think we should get to a point where we, we need to see a couple points of reference. Like at these days, anytime I see something, even there was some video in the articles that we were mm -hmm. researching for this, this thing where someone said, you know, the Chinese version only shows educational stuff to kids under 14 and TikTok shows this. I looked at it and I said, that might be the case, but I don't know because that's the only place, the only person right. I've ever seen, I, I've seen say that I'm going to need to see that in three or four other places. It's not the entire people. truth as people have like responded to. Yeah. yeah and, and so I was like, but, but I, but my back, my immediate reaction nowadays is that, well, he said that now I can go now research a couple different places to figure out whether other people say the same thing, preferably people who don't necessarily agree with him, yeah. um, you know, on other things. And so if I can see those contested opinions that are going towards that then maybe it's the truth but, me, but you know it's, put, but that's the thing you have to be careful of i want to put words in your mouth briefly but i want you to know if you agree with them which is i think it's <laughs> uh it's not trust it's not we don't trust anything it's more that you want to engage critical thinking about any source that's provided to you so yeah. some things can be trustworthy once they're vetted and it's different than you know i'm going to do my own research it's like no i'm going to use legitimate sources not any source i find to back something up and um we raised my my wife and i raised our kids with really almost no broadcast tv and very little mm -hmm. tv until they got over older partly because they were so fascinated by 
client, and we thought this is probably the wrong direction they can make decisions as <laughs> they get older because, you know, the usual things. Anyway, but like when we watch TV with them, when commercials show up, it is the most fun because they ridicule the commercials. They poke, oh, yeah. if we can't fast forward, they are the most critically critical consumers of advertising. I'm like, all right, they can watch as much as they want now because their attitude is correct. The dubiousness with which they approach information presented to them without factual basis. And I think that there was some point, you know, like my kids, you know, I, I made them have to get their apps approved by me. So I, which still is, the, you know, they're 14 and 15 years old. And so they didn't really get any social media, you know, apps. And now they don't want them. Like I said, do you want like all my, all their friends have Snapchat, right? And mm. no, they're like, no, because that makes everybody super stressed. Like, like they're like, and, and my daughter's like, if someone wants to talk to me, they're gonna have to text me. Cause I, like, you know, just, just messages is all my, I need. My um, teens are like, perverse. They got on Twitter after I got <laughs> off. I left in November, 2022. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, yeah. They got on, but just to laugh at how bad it, like they spent months laughing at how bad it was. Then they finally got bored with it. But I was like, all right, again, that's the okay attitude. They're and, and, late teens. So yeah. And I think that we need to have more tools. Like one of the reasons that I, I, I probably spend of any, social media of like reading it, I probably spend more time, even though I don't spend as much time as I used to on X, I probably spend more of it. But the main tool that I, that keeps me there is the filter. Like when I, if I once turned my filter off for a day, I have, uh -huh. oh I filter out about 170 terms. So there's 170 terms that, that are in my list. I counted them the other day. Someone asked of all these things that don't show up in my feed. If, if you say these things or they're from these people or about these people like Trump, I don't, I never see anything that Trump posts, mm -hmm. so or didn't for a long time, and um, and so, but all of these things are all these things that I don't that I don't see, mostly because I just don't want to be activated. I'm here to have fun, so most of mine is filled with audio, you know, audio uh, engineers and and uh, videographers and designers and comedians, and I have a great I have a great version of X, and even then I get <laughs> yeah, bored. Yeah. I, I get bored with it, but my version is way better, and I'm always like. And by the way, if you're watching, I am not going to give you my list because it'll make everybody upset because I, I filter out things from both sides. I'm just like, <laughs> I don't care. Like, I don't want to hear any politics. Like, I'm. it's not that I don't think politics are important. It's just that I don't think that mm -hmm. Twitter is capable of, of, of delivering that effectively. <laughs> So, you don't have to drink the castor oil okay, either. It's okay. Yeah. It's like, this yeah, is the so, whole point of it, customizable it so media. Much, it is so enjoy, like, it is so much more enjoyable. I, again, and it's gotten kind of weird in the sense that it's not super weird for me because I filtered most of that out. But it's just not as, there's just not as, it feels like there's not as many people there anymore. Like a lot oh, of people absolutely. that I was following just don't, just don't post as often. It's, and I don't it's post a bit of a ghost often. town, like obviously. Are, are you still seeing ads, Alex, on Twitter? Because to me, that is the thing kind of hurting the experience. Like it's like ever, after every two or three posts at this point. So I don't really, oh, wow. you know, I scan so quickly. I, okay. I'm scanning so fast. I used to like be like, no, no, no. And I would block every person that did a, a, an ad. Mm -hmm. So if you did an ad, I would just block your whole account. You know, like, like just, and to yeah. just try to get rid of as much as I could. Of course, that's like whack-a-mole. And so now when I'm scanning through it and I have to admit, because I have a critical mass of followers, not a lot of followers, but enough that most of my time is spent in my notifications. Like I post and most of mm -hmm. my stuff is responding to people who responded to me. Like I don't really spend as much time reading the raw feed as, as, as I used to. It's mostly this is me why my favorite uh, email folder is the sent folder. Just to, that's the stuff you're paying attention to, right? If somebody replies to you, it right. still shows up there. So that's the, the thing. And, and, I, and I leverage it. Like I, I, yeah. I was cleaning before we, a couple hours before the show and I, and I found a scorpion in my, in my garage. Oh, fun. Oh, wow. And I was like, and wow. I could have taken a picture and I could have done a bunch of Googling, but I didn't. I just took a picture of it. I put it on Twitter and I said, what kind is this? And immediately came back with an answer. <laughs> like I was like, it's sure, sure. better than Google. Yeah. Like someone came back and, and of course, and then I, 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 I Googled that. And of yeah. course they're totally yeah. right. And so it's like, you know. It's uh, it's, it's hard because I find now living between a lot of different apps is, is deeply frustrating the past mm -hmm. like year Same. or so. Yeah. And I feel like th th there's a, uh, my kids are not really into social media at all. And I get same as you said, you know, they didn't, uh, we didn't raise them with it. We kept uh, yeah. that stuff away from them. They're into YouTube. They're into the idea of, I mean, they know about memes. They kind of make their own shared Google docs of like found memes, which is bizarre. Like, you know, like there's like a, there was like a shared right. school list of just like, like meme things that they were all curating for themselves and talking about or laughing about. And they, they do see through it. And, um, I just feel like I, I want to reach out to the people I want to reach out to, you know, it's like a person to person basis, but right now it's not easy to do that. And then there's so much that falls off when you move from app to app where the traction works differently, where I find that if I'm posting one place, mm -hmm. um, people don't see it or they may not react or the conversation might not start or here it might start. So it feels like a lot of different parallel universes and like well, shards of, of, of the same group of people. 
It's driving me crazy. And well, the invisible one behind all this, of course, is Discord. I'm in probably 30 Discord servers. And so they're all like, and they're all different versions everything else. And each one of them has its own set of structures and its own set of rules. And so, right. and so like the one that the office hours global, which is the one that I, that I have we have about 2000 people talking about things about, you know, around media production. Um, but then there's other ones that are just talking about how to do better on this or how to do, you know, and then there's the twit one, which is excellent as well that I'm on. Um, it was just seven or 8,000 people. And, um, and so, uh, so between all of those, you end up with, that's a whole nother place that I think a lot of people have taken refuge. Um, uh, with the, uh, you know, from, from all the social Absolutely. medias, you're in well, the Reddit conversations. It's an interesting problem when you're trying to promote something also is I've talked to a lot of creators. I'm a creator myself and it used to be, you go on Twitter and that's where most of the people were. And then you use Instagram, you use some other different things. So I launched this Kickstarter campaign a few weeks ago. I'm like, oh, I just need to post on uh, Mastodon on oh, Blue Sky. And yeah. I just set up a Facebook account, which I canceled because one of the largest comics related, comic sister related groups, the place you reach the most people in the world, it's a Facebook group. It's not available anywhere else. Oh yeah, there's the three discords that I know are interested. And then link in and I'm like, I have this well, list of, gonna, you know, 15 places. I was going to say that the, the most effective one, as far as when I'm always surprised by, when I look at stats from what we're doing and everything else is LinkedIn, like it's LinkedIn, cool. like someone, there was somebody who post, I, I talked about a, a company in one of our show in the show, in a show and the company reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, Hey, that was really great. Can we, uh, can we use that? Can we post that on LinkedIn? I was like, yeah, uh, sure. You know, like I wasn't really thinking like, sure, you can put it on LinkedIn. And there was like thousands of views that obviously came from that that one post, you know. And, oh, yeah. and oh so, my gosh! That's because great. when it gets posted to LinkedIn, I think that there's it's. A, I will admit that I relate to LinkedIn much differently. Like Twitter is me having fun posting pictures of scorpions. I would not post a picture of scorpions on LinkedIn, like you know, like because it's my professional network of people. Right. Like I'm not going to, you know, or I'm not going to put up weird polls or funny things that I'm just kind of curious about. I entertain myself on X, but I, you know, and hopefully entertain other people every once in a while. But LinkedIn, I take really seriously. Like I put up a post or I like a post or I comment on a post and I think about every single one of them. I don't know if everybody does that, but I know LinkedIn, that, but it's very, very effective. LinkedIn is the millhouse of social networks, right? <laughs> like you don't, it's just kind of there, but all of a sudden it, it matures. It has a growth spurt or at some point it gets uh, somewhat yeah. interesting in high school. And now this is, this is LinkedIn's time to shine, everybody. Yeah. I think Twitter, least, yeah, the decline uh, of Twitter meant yeah. that you put more professional stock in it. And I feel LinkedIn also broadened where it's not, some people do use it socially uh, or more socially, but I feel like I'm comfortable posting my projects there as as well as, you know, kind of in the, the vein of uh, active professional achievements, as opposed to before, I think I didn't post there very much at all. I didn't use it. I didn't even have a LinkedIn account until last year when I started doing some, you know, Kickstarter consulting. I'm like, I got to be on LinkedIn if I'm actually talking to business people. Oops. So, uh, yeah, but it's, but it's, I think, more lively than I expected. It well, is, and, and, absolutely is, yeah. Yep. And right now, a lot of people are picking up on on uh, newsletters. I guess are now the thing in LinkedIn. <laughs> so, so the uh, so uh, you know, I'm even looking at how do I start creating like a media, you know, kind of newsletter that that keeps people up to th you know up to things. But it seems like the best platform for that kind of thing right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. You know, I want to talk more about like what has happening now with social media and everything. But uh, let's let's hear from Leo for a word from our sponsor once again. Let me interrupt just for a moment. Thank you, Devendra and, and gang. But I, I want to tell you about a tool we use here at Twit to do our hiring. It is so good. We've used it for years. It's called Zip Recruiter. Uh, did you set your clocks uh, forward? Daylight saving time. It starts up again. Of course, the goal to give us more daylight, March through November. I actually love daylight saving time. But setting your clock forward may make it feel like there are more hours in the day, but if you're hiring, it doesn't necessarily help you find qualified candidates for your roles any sooner, right? One more hour in the day, just one more hour you've got to spend going through resumes, right? No, not with ZipRecruiter. There's only one way to get your next hire, ZipRecruiter, and right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. We love ZipRecruiter. Doesn't matter whether it's daylight saving time or winter time, ZipRecruiter works around the clock to find qualified candidates for you. With ZipRecruiter, your posted job goes immediately to 100 plus job sites. So you're casting the widest possible net to reach that perfect employee that's out there somewhere. ZipRecruiter's smart technology then really helps by scanning through thousands of resumes to identify people whose skills and experience match your job. They send you their names and invite you to apply. And I got to tell you, when somebody's invited to apply, they do 
in 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 numbers, and it's much more likely they'll take the job too. And in today's competitive job market, that's a real leg up. Spring forward with a new hiring partner, Zip Recruiter, and find top talent sooner. See why four out of five employers, including Twit, who post on Zip Recruiter, get a quality candidate within the first day. Just go to this exclusive web address to try Zip Recruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash Twit. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash T-W-I-T. Zip Recruiter, the smartest way to hire. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I send you back to Devendra Hardawar and uh, This Week in Tech. Thanks, Devendra. You know, speaking of social media stuff, guys, I, I do kind of wonder, like, where where are you living these days? Because I do find myself a little abandoned by Twitter, to be honest. Like, So I'm spreading myself between Mastodon for tech stuff and Blue Sky for kind of all the fun pop culture stuff. Where Where does everything sit for you guys at this point? Do, do you... Do you get much response from Mastodon and Blue Sky? It depends. Um, I have okay. some people that I actually know that moved over from Twitter, and I mainly engage with those folks. And occasionally I get, like, random people kind of joining in. But it is there's far less engagement, and that is a big downside. Because I remember that even the early days of Twitter, like, people will just be jumping into conversations. It was a very lively experience, and Mastodon is not quite that, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, I'm on I'm on Mastodon and it's been very good to me. I went in big from Twitter and I never had a huge following on Twitter. I mean, in relative terms, I, f I had like thirty thousand people following me. Pretty and good. I followed thousands. Yeah. Right, I mean, right, absolutely. <laughs> it's it was fun. It was a cultivated group of wonderful people, <laughs> and uh, and many of them fairly technical and artistically involved. And a lot of that group went to Mastodon. So I have like thirteen thousand people following me there, which. I'm shocked by because again, the only time I interact with any kind of audience is like on Twit. Like I have a very weird set of things I write and do, and so people, it's hard for people to find me. So I don't know. I got that audience to kind of come over, and uh, and I because I was committing to Mastodon early on, I was posting and, and engaging. But Mastodon, I feel, has almost a dampening field intentionally. Like it's designed to prevent amplification, so that things don't you know, cycle out of control. Well, we don't have the uh, main character of the day on Mastodon almost ever occasionally happens like happened literally daily on Twitter. It still does elsewhere. Blue sky has had some main characters of oh, the day. Oft, all, all the time on blue sky. See, yeah. And, but blue sky is also, a, I think a curated experience too, which is I, I originally was kind of, I thought, well, I don't want to be on another network and I don't want to be on one that Jack Dorsey has anything to do with. And then yeah, he kind of walked yeah. away from it a bit. Like yep, he yep. distanced himself and the developers are very cool. So I actually find, uh, Blue Sky very entertaining, but I, it's a it's the number of people I follow and follow me there. It's a much smaller mm -hmm. audience, and the algorithm there, even though you can kind of look at is you know, the Discover tab and so forth, it doesn't feed as much. I don't think there's as much feedback of outrage there either. The machine isn't fully functional yet; may not become. I hope it's a very proto machine in that respect. I will say, like a uh, Blue Sky does have the element of chaos that I think made. Twitter so good early early on and you kind of need that for the internet like the early the mid 90s internet for me was pure chaos and I loved it and I kind of love being in that sort of environment so blue sky has sort of captured that whereas Mastodon is like you know when you go to the computer lab you know in, in the school <laughs> and it's just like a bunch so of nerds rude. who's been sitting there for too long and it's like yeah I like talking to those people but I, I need I need life too like I need, I need to do something beyond that group um but cool so Scott well, yeah. Scott what are you up to these days I'm split like I'm split all across and I'm not happy about any of it mm -hmm. you know I think that it's um and and I agree with you about the loving chaos and then it's also like we've all been traumatized by chaos yes. and then yes. I think that there's like no clear resolution on like I now find it hard to engage with or to create in those zones and so I find that it's I'm in an uncertain zone. I don't know if I'm falling out of social media or I'm, I, I still feel like I need it. So, you know, Twitter, yeah, sure. I should be out of it. And, um, and I, you know, I, I want to be completely out of it. The number of people that I have as followers on Twitter is far, far greater than on anything else by like a vast, vast margin. And it's not a huge amount of people, but it's like, you know, it's the difference between like 20,000 versus 500. And, you know, for me, threads I keep throwing myself at and um, staying in it. Um, it's not enjoyable. Ooh, it's too desperate. Way yeah. I don't find it enjoyable. And I keep going out. It's like music I'm trying to like. I'm like, I'm like, mm -hmm. I what I'm going to like this at some point. I'm supposed to 
This is the flow. It's this not this is me listening to me. Taylor I, Swift. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, I don't find any <laughs> engagement. I don't know who's following me there. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't find it easy to even post on there. Um, and it just feels like it launched fast and is like, what? What happened now? And then Blue Sky and, and Mastodon, I, I adore the ideas of it. I just don't go to them much at all. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. I still have the small micro whatever following that I had and I'll post something. I'm not consistent about it. They didn't seem... I didn't seem to find the flow of it. I find lately, and I don't know what it is, but I feel like, you know, pre-Musk, I had the, you know, I understood the 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 vibe or the flow mm-hmm. of what my engagement with with Twitter was supposed to be. And I found this flow of it that just felt like whatever it is, it is what it is. And I'm just not finding, I'm grabbing that flow of anything right now. It all feels like music that's all out of rhythm. Everything's all weird out of beat. And I go, is it me? Have I gotten old? Am I, you know, what, what is it? <laughs> What's happening here? But like, and same thing with TikTok. Like I'll be like, oh, people look, oh, the algorithm's great. You got to kind of feed it a bit. You got to kind of do stuff with it. And I'll go on there and it'll just feel like a little fire hose and I'll um, yeah. make some absurdist, you know, um, brief TikTok that, you know, maybe a few people see. And then I go, okay, well, that was a thing. Same thing with Facebook. Like I had such a tough relationship with Facebook for a long time. Where I said, okay, I get it. It's my old friends and my old, you know, tentacles of all the old people from the past. And I didn't know what, I feel like news stories were definitely being repelled from them or nobody saw them or nobody seemed to care. So I started putting up like pictures of oatmeal that I was having, like different spices in my oatmeals. And people seemed to like that, but literally it was like, does anyone hear this? Is it, is it here? Is it not here? Am I trolling my own family? Um, And then I, I just kind of feel that way now where I just feel like it's a, it's a random flail or I'll just go, maybe I should just go back to reading a book. You know, maybe yeah. I should just like write a play and I don't, I have a real like existential crisis about all of it right now. And, or, and I, I don't know how to deal with that. It makes me feel very, um, at times it makes me feel very out of touch or then I'll fall back to my easiest flow is unfortunately Twitter. That's what and happens. I'll go, yeah. you know, I go, that has my, um, like what Alex is saying, like it has my, there are certain feeds in the VR air landscape mm. or following, you know, sports stuff that I'll go, okay, well it's it, it, the curated flow works. I'm trying to make that curated flow work on threads and it's not, I don't know, I'm getting too much like weird character of the day stuff, as you say. What's, um, what's the, not, says, what's work. your, what's the thing that drives you to, social media because i felt like different things had at different times some of it's marketing for me for projects i'm working on but a lot of it during the pandemic the the height of the pandemic it was i want a place where i can go and hang out because i'm in my house with my lovely family who i love but we all spend a lot of time with each other (laughs) and then the post sort of lump of the pandemic is people are still i mean i don't know we're all four or five of us working from home i work from home yeah but yeah, yeah yeah so it's like I don't know. So it's, it's, do we still have that thing? We're trying to find a thing that replaces, uh, we don't have a second place. We lost our second place and our third place is harder to find because everyone's kind of moved around too. So I don't really have yeah. a third place and <laughs> it, I never had a second uh, place. I'm a freelancer. It's sort of like an eighties movie. Um, the community center was bought and turned set on fire. <laughs> by the villain. <laughs> oh no. Now we're, all, we're all just like, Oh, well, well somebody was supposed to save this, but John Cusack never showed up to help. <laughs> Well, and I and yeah. I think that for, for me, I guess Twitter's still kind of an automatic just because, again, like mm-hmm. what Scott was saying, my following there is much larger than other places. And so mm-hmm. if I want to interact with, and but it can be something like I'll ask people a question like, what about this? Because I'm interested in what they think. Um, I'm just kind of interested in what the, you know, the temperature of the people that see my post. Uh, I'm not doing anything scientific mm-hmm. um, or I find out what kind of scorpion is, was in my garage. Um, <laughs> right. But those are the kind of things that I'm that I, you know, and it's so fast, like it's so much easier than. Chat, even chat GPT, it, it, out, it outdoes chat GPT on the speed, um, you know, of, of image recognition. Um, I think for me, you know, I, when COVID started, of course, I started this thing called office hours where I, I hang out with people two hours a day talking about media production. And so for me, that kind of filled that in because I'm still doing it. We haven't missed a day in almost four years. Um, I love and, that uh, idea, by the way. Yeah. And it, it's really, it's, it's absurd. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone to do it every day, seven days a week for four years. I don't recommend <laughs> taking something on like that. We just thought COVID wouldn't last so long. And then once we had gone through two years of it, we were like, eh, might as well keep going. And so, um, and so the, uh, um, but for me, that you know, that's, it takes, you know, to do the show, it takes 15 or 20 people. So there's just people, all these people that you see every day. And then the discord, 
that we have that has 2000 people and they're all talking about those things. And what happens with discord, of course, it's all, where all your direct communication is with everybody too. So you're always ch chatting with folks and everything else. And so while I work at home, I feel connected to a pretty large global uh, audience. And then there's the twit, the twit discord as well. And so you have all these people that you're kind of connected to talking about it. So I don't feel like I don't lean on a lot of the social, I, I will admit that discord has been a really powerful tool where I feel connected to a lot of different vertical communities um, in production and so on and so forth, where I, those are the things that I would have done on social media five mm -hmm. years ago. And now, yeah. you know, 25 discord servers solve that real quick. <laughs> in fact, on Sundays, I, I have to just go through and say red, 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 <laughs> because it just, it's just, there's so much data there that I can't. Way too much. Know, so it, it, it feels it, like with it discord, we are re, re, basically reinventing IRC, except with, with rich media, you know, yeah. like and it's used so much more but, going on. Yeah. But it's like use net where everything is an alt dot header hierarchy well, top I, yeah. that, has, that has mid journey in it yeah. <laughs> so oh my god so, no it's, like, it's someone says something funny you'll see me typing because i'm going i'm going to just type this in and see what mid journey comes out with you know like like like, like let's just see what this looks like so yeah it's a uh, yeah the discord thing is interesting because i think it's been very successful but in all the different fandoms and professional stuff i'm involved in i, I could probably be in 15 discords i'm in three because i i don't I have, oh, i'd have to be a full-time job you're a little discord baby it's too I much know. well it's if i put much. in if i was yeah. in the fourth one i'd have to not make a living i'd be on the street so you it feels like it's like too to much time to, to feed it skin. you go oh, i'm not gonna look at that server this week <laughs> you know like thing. i don't I try to deal. look at them all I can't deal with managing. I can't deal. Like I'll end up ghosting out of stuff if I feel like I end up getting too much commitment to anything. Like I have to pick my communities carefully that I know I can spend time with. But I do feel like it's a lot of time on social media. I'm trying to almost have a conversation with with a you know with a room of ghosts or you know I feel like I'm trying to like start a conversation. Oh. And I guess I should just be posting what I'm writing on, and I do that a lot. But then you know I'm sending little ships out into the ocean. Yeah. But like yeah, th threads. I was like it, classic example. I was like you know, I, I, I literally wrote, I want to have, I'd love to have more conversations on here. Like, um, Ulipo, does anyone else read books on this? Cause I'm reading a book on Ulipo, which is like, you know, kind of become f uh, fascinating to me. Mm. No responses to that. One. <laughs> no, no, no likes or response. Si dead silence to that one, which is fine, but it is general, the general feeling I have when, you know, I have an obscure thought or something that's in my head and I go, I want to see where that echoes out there. And I go, I, I guess I it's a that. discord. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. They, they all get missed. And, and then, um, I think that, that's just the feeling of it. I just feel like a person mumbling on a bench. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm, I feel like social media now is just me kind of like mumbling on a bench mm -hmm. somewhere. And I go, well, it's nothing. That doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't make me feel great. And I don't feel like I know where the conversations are. So do I just lean on like texting my, my good friends to chat about this, which well, is I'll, what I would do. I'll tell you years the, ago. The sure, secret of, the secret of mass. Oh, the secret of mass. And by the way, is to follow Lisa Melton is a retired Apple engineer. And Lisa is a super connector and also a super retweeter. So if you know Lisa yeah. and you follow Lisa and if Lisa manages to follow you, I've known Lisa for a few years, uh, then, uh, she's constantly, she's like the super connector of Mastodon. So there is, there is an unobtainium and that is Lisa. <laughs> So uh, that's, that's that's the secret. Great. Is she knows everybody. Everybody <laughs> loves her. And uh, anyway, that, that's the answer. Just, that's you do the realize answer, people with a lot of views, like people with a with a lot of followers. Um, their their life and Twitter, you know, is completely different than ours. Like you realize, like every once oh in a while, I get this God. glimpse because, like, uh, you know, uh, I know Justine Ezrick, you know, I Justine, and and every once in a while, she'll comment on something that I did or or. Or um, or if you'll retweet something, and you just log look at your statistics. It's like this, 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 and then there's this giant spike that was oh, yeah. just one of some random thing that she said. Oh, I like right. that or whatever. Right. Like it wasn't even something she was focused on, you know. And you just realize that there's an entirely different world out there that is not not the one that we're having. They just live differently from I, us, you know. I like yeah. being like the C minus list or whatever it is, and it's like, well, like but occasionally I, you meet somebody in the A list and or B plus list, and you're like, well, oh, <laughs> that's what it's like. And and I and I like the fact that I, I think that that um uh you know I I'm not very organized about Twitter. Twitter is literally you know because I, I was there very early on and I don't take it very seriously and I just post things that I find fascinating or interesting or things that I think people should see and there's not really any plan <laughs> you know, like, and I think that I you know so I think that it's so I think for me it works out I, I I'm never going to get mm -hmm. used to saying x but but the but as but it's it's kind of like this kind of fun little toy that I have that I can play with that I get to get and again 
I love the people that I'm connected to in Twitter. And I think that that's the hard part is that even though I'm, I don't necessarily agree with every the direction that it's gone or how it's, what it's done, I'm kind of like, I don't know if I can give that up with, with Facebook. I just have to go once a month or two, once every two months. And I got to go up there and go, Hey man, sorry, I, I didn't yeah. respond to your, like, there's like 40 messages <laughs> and I'm like, I'm really sorry. I don't spend much time here, but, uh, hi, how's it going? I'll, I'll check yeah. this again in a month, you know? So, um, so that's, that's the only that, that's my biggest um, stress when I deal with social media too, is the idea exactly like I'm, I'm kind of just being myself wherever I am. And then, um, I don't have much of a plan, but then I think, well, if you have a plan, then, you know, you kind of develop this mission. It makes me feel like I'm turning into a machine. And then, yes, you know, the machinification yes. of social media and your identity mm. is very unsettling to me. And I see it happen over and over again, where it's like, you know, building your brand. And I've heard this over and over again, where you, you want to narrow cast your focus or do what people find interesting or what they're getting engagement on, or that shirt seemed to create good engagement or, you know, then I feel like you just become this um, increasingly amplified, narrow slice of yourself. And I'm, I feel like I'm always trying to battle that. Right. And as a result, yeah, I probably am the mumbling person on the bench, you know, where it's like, you know, OK, you know, you're not you're not being enough in, in any one particular thing. But I don't know, like I've made it well, to and, this point of my life I, so far. Yeah, yeah I, I think that for me, it is it's definitely like I do what I love to do and I hope other people will show up and see it. There's I think that there's two different things because we talk a lot about this with influencers of constantly trying to figure out how to build your audience. Like, how do we yeah. get another hundred thousand viewers or how do we get, you know, what what viewers, you know, yeah. how long should they be watching? And I play I, I fiddle. I, I pay a lot of attention to my very, very small YouTube statistics. Like I just pay, I pay, you know, like I, I look at it and I, I look, cause we do live every day, right? So I'm looking at the live feed and the live curve and how many people left and how many people stayed and, and mostly out of just learning what to pay attention to and what not to pay attention to. But I have, I think there's two schools of thought. One is, is to expand your reach so that you build up this large number of subscribers so that people will listen to you. The other side of that is to expand how you find the people who are interested in this little niche that you're interested in. And I think that that's a right. much more sane way to do this. Mm -hmm. It takes, it's a lot more work because you're now trying to, you know, pull up every, you know, like make sure that other people know that you exist. Um, but it, but I've decided that I'd much rather have it be, I'm trying to find more people that want the weird thing that I'm doing and not trying to find the widest audience that I can find because yeah. I feel like that just wouldn't, I just end up making stuff that I don't enjoy doing. And, you know, I kind of, the dream is always to be doing things that you love, you know, making content that mm -hmm. you love to make, which is like, like Mac break or, or mm -hmm. the thing I do every morning with office hours or twit, you know, when, when someone invites me onto this show, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's fun. I mean, like, you know, it's like, it's gonna be a good go time. Ahead. Yeah, um, Alex, it feels like you're trying to apply to Twitter, like what you or apply to YouTube, what you used to do on Twitter, right? It's just like, do what's fun, do yeah. uh, just yeah. get yourself out there. I'll say that that's kind of that was my thing about Twitter, too. And I think that's what was most enjoyable to it. I, I joined in like 2008. And then also, it was helpful to talk to new people in media when I wasn't quite in media yet and to make friends. And when I was in New York, like that's how I met a lot of people. and It was super useful. And to what you're saying, Scott, it does feel like a lot of um, some other social networks have just like devolved to very specific use cases. Like my thing about threads is it feels like such a cloud chasing engine. Like that's what yes. it feels like to me for the people who are always about building their brands. And it feels like that was the only conclusion, um, you know, Zuckerberg and the Facebook people took from Twitter is like, oh, this is about brand building, about getting your name out there. Engagement, likes, retweets, whatever. It's about manufacturing as much of that as possible. And that's what just doesn't really stick with threads for me. So it feels too artificial, I guess is the word, yeah. Yeah. And I like, I like, I take that approach too of like handpicking, you know, over time, just this like group that, you know, whatever it is that my feed starts to fill with stuff that begins to feel like it's fitting into that mm -hmm. idea zone or I, I keep you know removing one thing or adding one thing. And, and that's like a very painstaking, slow, natural process. And then it's like, I'm going to have to live in Mastodon for like seven years to like, yeah make that happen realistically there's no way i'm going to be able to accelerate that process it's and so you know i'm basically just gonna have to do this all over again and my feeling is like well shit like or you know like what what am i going to do now there's no way to we're not person-based like i, I kind of love the idea yeah, of like decentralized yeah. you know i want to i want to be able to just have a cloud of people that i know and just kind of follow around sometimes that gets imported sometimes it doesn't Sometimes it still doesn't feel the same, you know, then it's like, or you have people who aren't posting there and 
I don't know. And then I wonder, should I be different people in different places and just become like, you know, it's like going to call personality, for social media. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll be oatmeal man over here and then I'll be like, and I'll do well, this. Like it, mm-hmm. it encourages a sort of a psychosis. But I think that, I think that the, but I, I do think that like, like Twitter, I'm, I'm much more, uh, fun loving, so to speak mm-hmm. on LinkedIn. I definitely am ser- more serious. It's still saying the same person. It's just that there's definitely a lot of things I, I post on Twitter that I'm not going to post on LinkedIn. For sure. Tw- um, Twitter is yeah. you in a t-shirt and LinkedIn is you uh, putting is a sport it? coat over that t-shirt. You know? You're like, I'm going shirt. to the yes. I, I don't know if I put a sports coat on it, but, uh, but a polo shirt, maybe at least, yeah, a, yeah, at yeah. least something with buttons. You it's got to have your slogan for oatmeal, man. It's, it's a grueling job. <laughs> yeah. Free of I charge. Love it. Love it. I, somebody needs to write the book Zen and the Art of Social Media Engagement. Like that's what we need right now. We just need to like figure it out and um I don't know, calm ourselves. I will I, say though, I will never forgive Elon Musk for destroying Twitter. So I will that, that, yeah. put that out there. Um yeah. and kind of destroying the internet as I knew it. And I'm not bitter. Not at all. But let's talk about the next story. <laughs> Elon Musk SpaceX is building a spy satellite network for US Ooh. intelligence agencies um reuters had this exclusive yesterday i saw this news come out and first of all i wasn't too surprised but i do wonder what is the government thinking now that uh seeing where elon has gone after post twitter and uh now where he's on his um i don't know just sort of like anti-semitic white supremacist bent I, well, I, very wild yeah. love of china and seeming interest in russia and i don't know why that would be a national secure and his use of his alleged use of drugs that violate many of the rules required to operate certain kinds of government contracts even though it's not proven i think it's been denied officially yeah. but it is alleged by many parties but a lot of reporting on it uh so right yeah we we Elan seems like the wrong company to invest in except he may have the equipment that the government needs right now just it, just wild. it's a hard thing to figure out like i mean there's a lot of i mean th- what he's doing is hard like that's what that's what he's gotten good at is doing hard things and actually having them come out the other end mm-hmm. and that's a, an unusual ability because it's not and i think that's what's put him in this place is that you know boeing has obviously proved that it's hard <laughs> you know like you know this is a hard thing for you know to get things into space and have them work and so I think that the the satellite, you know, obviously um, Starlink has been a prove, you know, a good proving model for that, a good test model. The the thing that's important is is this very large array of satellites um, is much more uh, resistant to, you know, we are in a point where you take out a couple satellites in the United States and suddenly we lose all communication, like everything right, goes dark right. really fast. And so um, so I think that that there is this concern that we've built up these. 100 million, you know, 250 million, $1 billion satellites that are up there that are a handful of them. And if they go down, everything goes down, where if you have 12,000 satellites or 50,000 satellites up there, it's a much different thing, apart from the upset upset that this is created for astronomers. Oh, oh no, you, um, just, you just get a buffer overflow error and it goes to every satellite and communicates through mesh networking and they're all down maybe, also. So. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, the, you know, I think that there's a, there's a lot of, I mean, that's possible, absolutely. Um, but I think that, uh, but it's, it's, it's harder to do that, I will argue, than it is to shoot them down. Like, you know, and, and yeah. so, and well, so, oh, and, yeah, absolutely. And we, we should can, not assume that all the countries, all the major countries already have satellites up there that are armed and ready to shoot the other ones down. I mean, that would be, we should not assume that that doesn't already exist. <laughs> so, so, but there's, but the ability to have um, a large number of satellites up there does make a difference. And it, the problem is there's not a lot of other people. Amazon's doing it, but, you yeah. know, I think that uh, there's, there's not a lot of other options, I guess, is what I would say for that. And it is a very needed technology. And so, and the, we've, we've gone to, you know, our country has, has used, you know, MCI was a big benefactor. You know, there was a long time where an MC, if, if you were, if you had a MCI satellite access in Africa and you suddenly lost, uh, suddenly lost connections or your connectivity went down, you knew that uh, AFRICOM was active. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, like so, because they would take over all the satellites. So, the, so the, um, oh, so the, uh, uh, so the, you know, MCI built its entire infrastructure based on supporting the military. So the, so the, um, uh, so I think that we, uh, those are, um, uh, I think that I think we just have to know that they're go- we're going to have to use commercial, and so you're going to pick some. Someone's going to be commercial, and he's been the most effective is, of the bunch. The most, so far. He's getting it. He's getting you know satellites up there. Starlink is a thing that exists. I think um, I, first of all, I want to get the full context here. Reading, I'm going to read from the Reuters piece. The network is being built by SpaceX's Star Shield business unit under a 1.8 billion dollar contract signed in 2021 with the National Reconnaissance Office, the NRO. 
the intelligence agency that manages spy satellites. And I think the idea is that it's just going to be a global, you know, global array of, uh, of satellites that can, with high quality imagery or with high quality sensors, that can see anybody and track anybody anywhere on the planet at higher detail and resolution than we've ever had before. So, yeah, I, I can imagine the U.S. government wants that. Um, my worry is after we saw what happened with Starlink um, early on in the Ukraine and Russia war, right, where it's Elon Musk himself kind of like enabling and disabling access because, um, you know, all of a sudden uh, he was called in to help because he's the man in charge of this. I'm more worried about him than the tech because he's not the guy personally responsible for developing this tech, right? He has been very good at hiring and taking over companies um, that have been developed by other people, but also hiring smart people to build his his big dreams. So, you know, that's my I, I worry. Think, I think the issue yeah. is, though, is that it's one thing for him to, you know, Starlink, uh made in a huge difference at the beginning of the Ukraine war, um, you know, to, you know, empowering Ukraine to be basically be able to operate, you know, and be able to have them um, move forward. And I think that it put him in a pretty complicated position. I'm not a big fan of, I'm mm -hmm. not saying, but, but it put him in a very complicated position of supporting, you know, getting into a, a war that is not what Starlink was necessarily designed to do. And by the way, the government not paying him to do that either. <laughs> so, so that, you know, so all the costs are all sitting on his shoulders for something that, that, that doesn't, um, that it wasn't what he planned to do with these. So I think that there's, that's on one side. And didn't he volunteer pulling, the resources? Uh, he did. And I, yeah. I think they were going to write him a check at one point, yeah. if I recall as well, but it's, yeah. it's the lack of transparency. He acts like but, a government is well, the issue. Uh, he, lack of transparency on right. his decision-making and actions that are affecting geopolitical issues. Yeah, but I think that th there's a difference between him affecting the, the how a commercial system is being used in a military application to pulling the rug out of the United States Defense Department like or, or the NRO. That is like, chances of him doing that are pretty low <laughs> you, know, like, you know because I you know would because not the government asked him at this point so maybe yeah. but i'm just saying that, that from a from a statistical perspective that is mm -hmm. the end of all the things like you know like if you did that to the united states government sure you know, especially to the nro they're not going to have any sense of humor about that you know like you know and, and it's and so like there's a gray area when you're doing it inside of the ukraine where there's a mixed uh, support for that and everything else is up and down um, but there's a whole nother thing about like building a contract with the United States government. So I, I think that those are very different. I don't think that they, they live in the same world as far as what the, what yeah. the, he would actually do. Cause that I, would be I hear crazy. that, but yeah. I'm, we're also looking at, uh, this man engaging with white supremacists like several times in the past few days and just like, yeah, but you're talking about that's cutting, him cutting, the, yeah. cutting off yeah. the United States, the United States intelligence agency is the end of all of your companies. Uh, like, yeah, like that just, would be yeah. Yeah. like the government would come down so hard on him. That would be the end of whatever he's doing. Mm. Like it would be, you know, he couldn't get into a contract with the NRO and then mm -hmm. renege on it in any way, shape or form. Um, if, if he's lucky to get out of the country, <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, that's <laughs> like, that's one of those things where, oh, he got into a car accident. How about that? You know, like, and so, so that, you know, but they, they would take that, no sense of humor about yeah. being turned over like that. And so I just don't think, I just, I, mm -hmm. I just think that there's. He does a lot of crazy stuff, but I don't think that's one of the ones that would fit into what he, where he would go because that that is a I think yeah. even he would understand I, how I don't dangerous think, that would be. I don't think that's the issue is I don't trust him with national security, so that's mm -hmm. separate from what would he do. I simply don't trust him with it. Period. I don't think we should be giving money well, to most, his firm based on his actions. Most of these not networks are based on not having trust with other people. Like most of the way the network interacts with the other. The way those satellites are going to interact with each other is not based on trust. I mean, that's how the no, system but he, is built. The money is going to his company. That's the whole point. And regardless, sure. regardless, I mean, fundamentally, do you engage with people who don't act in good faith and don't act in the best interests of the country that is providing the money? But this is this will actually tie in. The, the flip side is who else do you go to? They're the only player oh, because Boeing mismanagement. It all comes back to... <laughs> Plugs falling out of window or window oh, plugs man. falling out is if Boeing had them been mismanaged for the last 25 years in ways that were obvious, then Boeing might be a viable player to provide this service. It, is it goes not. back to witnesses uh, suspiciously dying, too. Yeah, like that's that. weird. They didn't fall, he didn't fall out of a window, though, but that's, that's the only... Yeah, mm -hmm. I feel bad for the guy. You read the reports and it's like, there's a lot of things that are dubious. We don't want to turn this into a Vince Foster mm -hmm. situation. But it's also, I just feel bad for the guy because he was trying to do what's right and maybe experienced. So if, if, this, if the narrative that is out there is mm -hmm. to be believed, he just experienced so much pressure he couldn't continue, mm -hmm. which is very, very sad for what he was trying to do to improve the safety of other people. Yeah. For the, for the SpaceX story, by the way, like I, I'm just wondering, like I'm not 
maybe he would not be dumb enough to do something like overtly screwing over the U.S. government. But uh, if it's like, hey, um, maybe when we're covering this particular quadrant of Russia or something, just like it's a little less clear. I'm just not clear he would know. Like, I don't think, you know, once they hand off this network to the United States government, he's not going to know what's happening. Mm. He'd record those videos, you know, you see where you slide in the video (laughs) that repeats and it shows like an ordinary hillside in front of the security camera. (laughs) And you just slide that in in front of the satellite that's looking at that part of Russia. Yeah, Yeah. it's... um, I I just think that it's not, it's a lot of those securities go into that process. The mm -hmm. the control of them, they're putting the, the bird into the skies but the control of those birds once they're there is, is going to be pretty uh sure, limited sure. Of, of what they know what what information would have would go out from them well let's uh let's talk about somebody else who went into business with elon musk <laughs> and that is mr don lemon from cnn who oh, revealed man. recently that uh his his uh sh- his contract with twitter to Amazing. promote a show uh on twitter service um has been canceled after one really testy interview with elon <sighs> I don't musk even think he got the it was before right it was before even one amazing amazing incredible i mean so so what happened here was uh don lemon who was fired from cnn for i believe it was comments against nikki haley just like his his like really uh, he he made some really terrible comments about her not being a woman in her prime and uh yeah he was out after that but there were also reports that he was just not great to his colleagues and not apparently not like that great in the morning show that they put him in yeah they put him in a cranky position where he i mean i'm not defending him but it's also like they they did not take advantage of what he was famous for and what he was doing well and then he did not behave well as a result he did not want to be on good morning cnn essentially so yeah it did not work out so well for him but yeah so he entered a relationship with elon musk who was trying to i guess uh, say hey twitter is a place for all sorts of political backgrounds right we have tucker carlson but we also have the guy from cnn so therefore we're unbiased and fair um one interview and don lemon is not even that much of a tough interviewer like i don't know um well, i've not seen clips here but apparently after one uh, there were some questions where he was directly asking elon about his i guess his own life and elon did not like how personal and how basically how that direction went but what do you think alex i think that i think that don lemon i think felt like he needed to show that he wasn't elon musk's lackey so i think he's in a position of i'm starting this but i'm not i'm not just following what elon tells me and i'm going to show that i'm willing to put you know um put the brass knuckles on and and ask the hard questions and do all the things to prove himself so he could separate himself from elon musk saying i'm on his platform but i'm still going to be independent so of course he he hit a lot harder than than he need, probably needed to mm-hmm. and went much more personal. I don't think it's the politics that bothered Elon Musk. I think it was the personal questions that bothered Elon Musk. And I think that, you know, I think it embarrassed him. I think it made him upset. And I think that, you know, that's probably, again, he, he might have over, I think Lemon might have, he may have done this on purpose. Like, I'm just going to see how far this will go. Like, I don't know if this is going to go anywhere. Sure, sure. I'm just going to see how far this goes and maybe I'll get some good press out of it anyway. So that I, might I have, have not been seen his whole the, I've not seen the full interview, so I'm not sure of the full context It's here. just the reports yeah. of him asking yeah. about drug use and asking about all those other things. I mean, I think that, that mm-hmm. he could have, he could have started a little, like really dealing with politics and policy mm-hmm. as opposed to going into, you know, going after personal issues. I, I, don't, um, I feel there like, that, that stuff may be related. Like the guy in charge, the second richest man in the world. There are all these stories about him. He, we, Don Lemon's now the poster boy for his supposed like, you know, Twitter is a more politically acceptable place for all sorts of people. It doesn't seem that unfair to me just because all the stories are out there and you have the guy in front of you. Whereas I don't think a right wing pol- politician, Tucker Carlson, will not be asking any of those kind of questions because he's they're going to softball everything so to me i guess that's where the politics comes in because don lemon's actually asking questions that he has never answered before and it's a basic function of journalism so that to me seems like a useful thing like i i don't think that's going too far it just seems like that's he's he i didn't say it was going too far, far. Yeah. i'm just saying i'm just saying that, that I don't, i'm not saying he went too far i'm saying that he just that's what got him i think that if too he had, far if, for elon i guess yeah i think if he wanted to get a lot of press which he's done well that was a great way to do it if he wanted to actually build a platform on twitter probably wasn't the right way to do oh, that. As, but as, he as was assured as, that he, he could made, ask anything, though. There were no ground assured. rules. Yes. So, uh, you know, yeah, that's, yeah. that's kowtowing to the... That's exactly the opposite of what Musk was was uh was like claiming was true is that everything goes so yeah. you know there's a business true decision there, but, uh, man. yeah yeah, yeah I, I think i would again if if you wanted to build a platform on on twitter if you want to build it i mean there's a certain level of knowing where you are in the food chain and and mm-hmm. so if you're going to build a platform going yeah. after the owner and asking them it again asking them about politics probably would have been fine asking <laughs> that's them personal not, questions 
But that's not, I mean, come on, I got to say, that's just, that's just, I, I hear you, but I don't think this is the issue at stake is Lemon was told he could ask anything. He was trying to show that he could be tough and he apparently asked questions that he claimed, I mean, we'll get to see because they'll post, he's claiming he's going to post all the, the footage on and it'll be on X, but it's like, actually the, the critical part though, I would argue, uh, Alex, is that ostensibly the one argument is that Lemon never signed the contract. So when the contract <laughs> was canceled, it wasn't right. actually signed. If that turns out to be true, <laughs> then that is a huge cell phone. You don't ask those questions yeah. until you have the signed contract Unless, guaranteeing you the money. But we're also talking about him and we have, for, you know, forgotten yeah, about I the show. I don't care about the you know, so, so, so he's, yeah, so he's got, you know, he may have gotten exactly what he wanted out of the, out of the whole thing. Maybe, but he doesn't have a platform now. So did he get what he wants? I you mean, know, he, he still has the platform. platform, right? So the only, he can still post well, on Twitter. It's a, the, he doesn't get the, the promotion. Deal. Yeah, he doesn't get the promotion, but now he can like pump this to YouTube or something, which is probably going to be a safer bet for him. You know, didn't Carlson sort of decamp too? Carlson was yeah. getting some promotion on X, but then didn't get, you know, I didn't seem like it was much going on there. And now he's got kind of his own thing, but he's also posting on X. So it didn't seem like Musk got much out of Carlson in the end either or vice versa. I don't I'm know. I've not fully paid attention to that, but uh, yeah. I don't know. I think this is hilarious. Just like seeing the the tough guy to a lot of Internet nerds is is so thin skinned that he cannot, you know, cannot survive one interview. I just find that hilarious. This, um, the yeah. whole thing made me laugh. I mean, I don't think of Don Lemon <laughs> as a tough guy. I yeah, don't care yeah, about yeah, Don yeah. Lemon. I don't read. I don't like to read anything uh, uh, that Elon Musk says ever. And then I just saw this like interview that led to the cancel, you know, the, the cancellation of whatever. And it's like, just don't have a relationship with Elon Musk. I feel like that's the th that's the thread of the last two mm. stories. You know, it's mm -hmm. like. Yeah, don't. don't How will he screw over the U.S. Musk. government? Let's tune in to right. find out. It's, There's a lot of Charlie yeah. Brown, Lucy football stuff with like oh. in the past, like seven years with like, you know, like people you don't like. And then you go, you do business with them and then they like screw you over. It's like, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. It's like punchlines. OK, did, uh, I'm did, like, I'm waiting for the next one. <laughs> did you see the Tesla pie story recently? I mean, that was like last month, but the where, where Tesla had ordered a bunch of pies from a small local pie shop and then canceled the order at the last minute and it was this whole disaster and the company the little pie shop could have gone out of business then elon graciously stepped in and said this is all a mistake and paid them for all the pies but it was still like it wasn't it was, it was like even pies buying too. pies it was a lot of a lot it, was like of pies. Three, it was like 3,000 pies, right? Or something. It was wild. Anyway, but it's like you can't even sell pies to a, to a Musk company without worrying. <laughs> you might wind up on the short end of the pie oh, stick. Man. I don't know what I'm, the stick Anyway, is. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this story and, uh, you know, whoever else Elon Musk does business with, business with in the future. Uh, but let's head back to Leo Laporte for a word from our sponsor. Thanks, Devendra. I got to tell you, they brought me back from vacation. I'm going to go back in a minute, but. I had to come back to do this because I am a customer, a happy customer of Mint Mobile. And man, I tell everybody about Mint Mobile. We love to highlight businesses that are doing things better, right? To help you live a better life. And I can tell you Mint Mobile is so much better than your cell carrier. Mint Mobile ditched retail stores with overhead costs. And the money they save goes right into your pocket. They sell phone plans online, pass the savings on to you. They say, you've probably seen the ads. They save money on the ads, too. For a limited time, Mint Mobile's passing out even more savings. Get this. For new customers, it's an offer that cuts all Mint Mobile plans to $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. What do you get? Unlimited talk nationwide, unlimited text nationwide, a big chunk of data, and it's just $15 a month. I love it so much. I bought a year plan because I saved so much. In fact, I ended. I realized I used less data than I thought, so I was able to go with a 5-gigabyte plan. But they've got a 15-gigabyte plan. They've got a 20-gigabyte plan. They've got an unlimited plan. And right now for new customers, it's all $15 a month. They all come with unlimited talk and text, high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can bring your own phone. They'll port your number over. You can keep your phone, your contacts, and everything. Or... Buy a great deal on a phone at Mint Mobile, too. I bought an iPhone SE from Mint Mobile. Saved so much, plus the inexpensive data. I, I It was a great deal. Ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's limited time deal. You'll get premium wireless service for just 15 bucks a month. You know what I don't miss? That giant bill for my old cell company. I love Mint Mobile. To get our new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, you just go right to mintmobile.com slash twit. Mintmobile.com slash twit. 
I don't know why anyone would pay any more. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month. Wow. Mintmobile.com slash twit. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower, above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. And now I'm done. I'm going back to Cabo San Lucas and leaving you with the in the capable hands of Devendra Hardawar. Take it away, Devendra. Thank you so much, Leo. Um, we also saw a story this week um, from Mr. Mark Ehrman, I think following up on all of his Apple Car revelations. Uh, he, he was the one who, who broke the story that that Apple Car project was dead after a decade, and he spilled some details about that. Um, in Mark Ehrman's latest newsletter uh, over at Bloomberg, uh, he wrote about how CarPlay is basically Apple's last gasp at the car industry. Um, we have seen a more advanced form of CarPlay being shown off, something that takes over the uh, the front instrument cluster, uh, basically all the screens at the front of your car. And Apple has not, uh, right right now that is something rolling out to like very expensive high-end luxury sedans. It's not coming to like a Corolla or something yet. Um, but Apple really has no plan for what to do with CarPlay at this point. Like they are spreading it out there. They're not charging manufacturers to use CarPlay. They're not charging customers or anything. German is uh, basically hypothesizing here that CarPlay, uh, that Apple will eventually have to charge for some element of CarPlay, maybe a CarPlay Plus for this higher end service. I'm just wondering, what do you guys think about this idea and about you know the, the end of the Apple car as well? Um, well, I just started trying to buy a car recently and then backed out of buying the oh, car. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, talk, let's talk, Scott. Let's yeah. talk. Yeah, because yeah. I'm doing a, little, a lot of research on that. Yeah, yeah. This is, it was very dramatic. Um, but, you know, I have a 2012 Honda CRV that just has regular Bluetooth connections. I'm so slow to upgrade. Oh, to tech. yeah. But like the new 2024 uh, Honda Hybrid was the one I was going to get. And I'm probably still going to. But then the prices, mm -hmm. I was dealing with dealers and it was ridiculous. And then I realized it could be gotten for less. And then and I you probably want out of my contract EV at this point. Like uh, just I was so tempted. EV it's such a I want to get an EV. Yeah. But, the, but the problem for me is it's our primary car. And that's a whole right. other thing where it's yeah. like I have not built the infrastructure in to do that. And I'm probably mm -hmm. a really slow adopter. And I feel very bad mm -hmm. about I'm not saying up for an EV, but I also feel like the tech is going to change a lot. And I like to live with a car for, for like 10 years and maybe I should lease. Um, that's a good point. I mean, we should actually research that even more. But then the CarPlay, like, you know, I like the idea of it. I don't want more of it. You know, I kind of feel like the, the way <laughs> yes. I feel about it is like, I love that it's there. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. so much better. If it took over the rest of the car, I think I'd freak out. And I don't like what cars do with software at all. But I do like that the cars have some element to themselves that's separate from that. And I would be fine paying a, a service for CarPlay if it maybe did more. I don't know if it, if it meant it would go away. But like, and I didn't, I didn't feel any interest in the Apple car thing. Although uh -huh. when someone was talking to me about like Tesla's, which I would not buy, um, they were talking about like, oh, it's so much easier to buy one and that, that, you know, you're not dealing with this, like, you know, let me check with my manager and like the mm -hmm. prices all seem like they're in some gray zone and that drive, that drove me crazy. And, you know, I felt oh, like car dealers are the worst, like it, the scourge of humanity. Yeah, it was. The, the and I just felt, is, I felt like you buy, through, yeah. you buy through Costco. I mean, I don't mean to promote, <laughs> they're not a sponsor, not promoting the brand. I have no affiliation with them. Even if I live in Washington state, the home of uh -huh. Costco, uh, you buy from Costco and they just, I, I've done this before and they're just like, it costs this much. And you go to the dealer, they're like, okay. And that's okay. the entire transaction. So that, that's I don't cool. know if it's still that good, but a, a proud 2014 Honda fit owner here, uh, Scott, so I'm in. I'm in your camp with uh, yeah. outdated cars. I've, I've heard. I've heard good things about that process. Absolutely. By the way, I have to say, I'm weirdly a fan of Carvana, even though that company has oh. been kind of messy. I have bought mm -hmm. uh, two cars over Carvana and have done like trade-ins and stuff. And there have been like some issues. Like the latest one, I got a uh, got a Volvo. Uh, because again, I also don't have the intra infrastructure or you know budget for an EV at this point. But it came with bad brakes. I called them. I was like, "Hey, these brakes are rusted." And they're like, "Oh okay, my god, new brakes." Wow. Just because it's a crazy startup. So they're like, okay, we'll just, we'll just replace that. And then dealer would, I don't, I don't know if a dealer would do much do. about that issue. Yeah. I, I'm afraid that I just keep looking. I have a 2014 Dodge Caravan and it has All an right. aux, <laughs> it has an aux uh, input. Oh boy. It's broken. So I have to, I have to pull, I have to put the aux 
into it and then pull it to the side and wrap it around something so that it won't go back to the radio. And then I have this little, uh, and I have this, this, um, the, uh, peak design makes the case that I have on, you know, on this phone and it, and there's, they make a little thing that hooks onto the, to the vent, like yep. latches onto the vent. And then I just snap this onto the front and I have a map and I have music and I am and fine. That's kind of, that's kind of <laughs> you know, all you this, need. And, and I have this to admit, I've been I, doing. my wife yeah. has a newer pilot, a Honda pilot. Um, mm-hmm. And every time I get into it, I'm like, oh, how do I get this thing to sync up and get the Apple pl- Apple thing to work? Because it's, you know, it's set up for her phone. And then there's yeah. too many phones already connected to it. And then I have to yeah. do this thing. I'm like, mine just works. It just, I just plug it in. I plug in the USB-C on the bottom. I got a souped up USB-C to, to aux out. So I got more audio power into the mm-hmm. car because it was a little too quiet. Yeah. And so those are the little things that I've done. And I have to admit, I keep on thinking, wow, I really like that whole car play, but I'm kind of, I kind of like my, my phone doesn't really work if you call me on in the car, which I kind of uh-huh. like, you know, like, and so, That's so, true. um, That's true. so I, so I, uh, um, it's been, and I, and the problem is for both my wife and I, we both have cars now that are out, you know, we, we got loans for them and they've been paid off for since, mm-hmm. Uh, since COVID. And I look at the probably thousand to $1,500 a month that I'm not paying for those cars. And and I don't drive very much anymore. I mean, I'm lucky to get to the garage, let alone go out most days. And, um, uh, and so I, I just, uh, you know, I kind of love the fact that I'm not paying for it. And I just find that a lot of people, like I remember growing up thinking that it was great to get a license so I could drive legally. (laughs) <laughs> I grew up on a farm, so I've been driving for a long time. Um, but by being able to drive like actually on the highway legally was really exciting. And my kids, there's not just, there's, there's not a lot of pressure, you know, like they're just not that interested. And the reason what's interesting is, is they'll say, well, then I'd, I'd have to, I can't be, I can't be interacting with other people on my phone if I'm driving. Oh. And that is just annihilating their interest in, and their friends, their interest in driving is because of their phone. It's because, you know, they don't want to do it illegally. They don't want to be like obviously texting and driving, but that means they don't want to, dr- not, it doesn't mean that they don't want to text. It means they don't want to drive. And also you like know, you, and you have enough really ways to puzzle. easily get around. Like if you're in a city with like decent public tra- transportation, that's fine. But everyone's just Ubering and lifting everywhere. Or, too, so. or just working yeah, from that home. Too. Or just or, working you know, from home. Like, I'm not I going anywhere. A- What's called a, sometimes called a numb tot. It's a new, it's a new urban memes for transit oriented teens. Ooh. Although my teen's about to turn 20. He's transit obsessed. He's going to school in Boston now. He's undergrad in Boston. And oh, nice. uh, he, you know, he will, he has a license. He may have to drive. He's going to go into, he's a music ed uh, major. So he's going to teach and who knows what city and whatever, but he is prioritizing his life around transit because he does not want to have to contribute to sprawl. He is actually very smart, socially smart. minded things, but I'll tell you, here's the most amazing thing. So Alex Scott and I, and I think Devendra, you said you bought two cars in the recent mm-hmm. past. We are, Alex Scott and I are like the least demographic people in our age group <laughs> in America. Guys. From like, well, I got a 2012, like I got here. a 2014, my Dodge gets yeah. amazing. Yeah. I, I guess I'm in a weird Good place work. right now because I, I have much younger kids than you guys, mm-hmm. it sounds like. So I have a five-year-old and I have a That's two-year-old. It. So my life is yeah. I, I, the, the daycare drive in the morning and the daycare pickup in the afternoon and soon school and everything. So I, I've been like very much researching family cars for a while. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's, yeah, that, my, my, my brain has just been here. I will say I originally had a RAV4, a 2017 RAV4 hybrid, and that didn't have CarPlay. I swapped over to a Volvo XC90 that does have CarPlay and CarPlay just makes all the difference because on the cars without it, um, if you're doing like aux audio or something, then you can't get map audio. You can't get map directions if you're listening to the radio. So oh, if you're exactly. Radio. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Which you I don't want. One like usually, uh, yeah. like my thing is I hate it. Speaker mode on the phone. Yeah, I'm yeah. always that's like, right. do not interrupt my music. Like that's what I uh, like is that yeah. I'm listening to music and I can go over to the map and and see where I'm supposed to go. But I'm like, and I don't. Admittedly, again, I don't mm-hmm. travel a lot of places where I need the map that often well, because I don't go very many places anymore. You know, and it was, I think that I am fascinated by the impact that COVID had in the sense that. Pre-COVID, I was traveling a quarter million miles a year. Uh-huh. Oh and post-COVID, I tra- I drive maybe 3,000 miles See, a year. So it's You and I are different. hybrid customers, like the, the plug-in hybrid. That's the I, I was like, I want to get an EV next car. We just got our electrical rewired uh, two years ago to get a heat pump, like all the exciting stuff, right? I'm like, I could get an EV port. And then I'm like, yeah. well, you know, I don't mm-hmm. think we're the right. I drive 20 miles to 30 miles a week. So plug in hybrid. Lucky. Yeah. 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 Plug in I hybrid. also, so I, I should also mention this. I did briefly have a plug in hybrid and I got screwed oh, yeah. over because it was a, it was a Chrysler. 
And I realized, I was like, I can trust an oh. American car at this point. Everybody loves the Chrysler yeah. Pacifica. Uh, three weeks after I bought it, uh, basically ban, uh, a global recall on that specific model because it could catch fire. And oh Chrysler gosh, spent like oh. nine months not doing anything, like yeah. not giving us updates, like not telling us like how it would be fixed. So I kind of just was like, I cannot just be ra- driving this thing with my kid. So I, I kind of took, I bit the bullet and I kind of like took the cost of like swapping over to that Volvo. So it was not the best decision, but it was because of Chrysler's crummy engineering. Um, but yeah. otherwise, plug-in hybrids are great. Like you can but, do. But I also think that, I think, great. I think that Apple also had to look at the fact that the, the, the trend of how people use their cars is changing dramatically. Oh, yeah. And that yeah. if you're not gonna release something until 2026, 2027, and hope that it turns into a real business by 2030, that's a whole different world from where we are now because they, we're seeing, totally again, we're seeing more people yeah. working from home, more people wanting to not have to drive very, very far. Um, the next generation, not cars are not their, identi- they're not their identity. You know, like there, and, yeah. and I admit for me, it was never my, really my identity. I drove, mm-hmm. I've never bought a new car. I've always bought old, I mean, Generally old BMWs, but then one, my last one died and I had the caravan as like, it's like a, a caravan's kind of like a truck. <laughs> but your cars like became old, a quarter million miles a year. Your cars were old in a year. So that's the other thing. Oh, no, no, no. I was flying those. Well, I was fly, flying those. Oh, I'm around. sorry. I was like, yeah, how did yeah, you I drive? Was, okay. Some people do drive a lot. I was flying a quarter million oh, miles a year. Like I was like definitely not driving. I, oh, now I, now if I drive, if I have to drive into San Francisco, I'm like, I'm, I'm in, I'm like 35 minutes from downtown San Francisco and you go. Um, how you, might I, just, you might as well like, just lift it. You, you might as well just taxi in because then at least you can still oh, do stuff on your taxi computer. Yeah? Bart, yeah. Bart, yeah. Bart, 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 Bart. Well, I know. I'm, I'm in. I'm in Marin, where we oh, have spent, sorry. We spent a century uh, resisting any connect, direct connection yes. to what to what the Marinites would call the riffraff. You know, I, like we don't. I just rode the smart network, the smart train in which is in Sonoma, which takes you between several cities barely in lovely Sonoma and only runs part of the day. <laughs> it's a big step up though. A Apparently. Drops you off in Larkspur where you're still a mile, Larkspur. a yeah. mile from the, from the, uh, like you have to walk, like, especially when it's raining or really hot, you have to walk from the Larkspur drop off on smart all the way over. Like they could have just run that. If they had run that train <laughs> all, and I think that they did this on, I think somebody did this on purpose. <laughs> yeah. If they had run that train all the way up to where the, um, where the ferries are, which are an amazing yeah, yeah. experience. Not, if you're, if yeah, you're which in, are great, right? So yeah. great. It's such a great thing to do. If they had just run that to the place where I don't have to walk for 20 minutes to get to them, mm-hmm. I would, I'd be, I would never drive to San Francisco again. I uh, would be taking the smart all the time, grabbing, I'd go into San Francisco all the time because I, now I, I can get in with the way that it's set up. It's like, no. No. I don't want to turn it into a transit podcast, but the Please. when I went, I flew in the Santa Rosa airport, yeah. which is great. And Smart terminates at the Santa Rosa airport a mile from the airport. And until yeah. last summer, there was no shuttle or anything. Now they run wow. a shuttle with a private company. Had a lovely conversation with the driver. I was it was a private shuttle, practically nobody on the bus either way. But I was like the only one taking the uh, was a train for me. But you're like mm-hmm. these are anyway. Not so these smart. are these are what get people uh, keep people in cars is the intermodal transportation nodes are missing. Yeah. That's yeah. Tra- that's the no, call. I'm an I'm an NJ uh, transit person, so you know for me I'm I'm uh, I'm lucky to walk. I mean, lucky to be walking distance to the NJ transit, and they can take that into New York that's City, crazy. where I'm not there that many times a week uh, since the pandemic. Um, or the ongoing pandemic or whatever, you know, whatever nether zone we're in now, but the, but the, basically the, 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 this phase. And then, so I don't drive a lot. And so I agree, like I'm not identified by car. I kind of can't stand cars and I feel like they're just a thing. They, they, I do relate to like David Cronenberg and crash and the idea of just like, just, I look at highways and I'm just like, yeah. I don't really comprehend the existence of this in the world. I'm not like kind of in love with it. And and then I go, okay, well, I need one, but then I want to stick with one for a while. And like, I agree, I'm paid off on it. So I don't want to, I don't want to deal with any of that all over again. It's at paying off a car. Like I hadn't had oh, that happen man. in a long time. Yeah. And, and when you have two paid off cars, it is like heroin. Like you're like, oh, I don't want to break boat. the, I don't want to break it down. Cause you're, you're like all that extra money that I'm not spending yeah. on this. You know, and, <laughs> well, and, and, and the insurance, like, when, you get, so, when you buy the new yeah. car, they give you the new insurance yeah. bill. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so I feel just, so happy to be clear of that. I started to get to the point where the car had been like, it started to have a few things wrong with it and the, and the, uh, the repairs were starting to mount up. So, and, and that was when friends had said to me, okay, well, this is the time that you should mm-hmm. be putting money into an, into uh, a, a new car. That's not that one. And so we started looking, but it just made me feel squeamish. And then I want to stick with that car for a long time. It goes back to my feeling on CarPlay, which is like, you know, will, 
I'm still curious about how this tech lasts over like 10 years. Yeah. And then well, I, I it, go it like, it goes I'm, with your phone is the thing. Like the, the current new CarPlay thing, the infotainment powered CarPlay is powered right. by your phone. It is not built is. into the car like Android Automotive is. So that's like the key. It's as fast as your phone is technically. Yeah. But then at the same time, I would, it would be kind of nice in some uh, idealistic world. I kind of feel like if, if, if you get to the point where like you want to upgrade your car, but not mm -hmm. get a new car, like have that element be modular, you know, right, like, like right. something that like, you know, it's weird to me how many parts of the car are not modular, you know, that are like, you know, you, you only get these things if you get a new car. Like I just go, I, I, I kind of don't, I understand, but I, I feel like maybe can, can that car play thing be something that, you could, it's a slippery slope. Cause I was going to say, as I'm saying this, I go, well, if that's something you could upgrade, then like oh. Apple and others are going to want to have a new one every, you know, couple of years. And then well, if they want you to pay for it. Maybe that, that is going to be the thing. Like maybe I, if they, think, yeah. yeah. I think for Apple, the CarPlay thing, I don't know if they'll make someone pay for it because I don't, mm -hmm. I think that a lot of it is just making sure that Apple users have a good experience when they're in the car. Yes. I think that's Apple's biggest thing is just to make sure that that they're not left out, that, that they don't feel like, oh, I can't connect, you know, because the car is still oh. something a lot of people use. Mm -hmm. And again, as someone who doesn't, who, again, my wife, I, I connected, I actually find the car play to be fine. Like, it's great to have it in the car and it shows up on the little Honda well, screen. You, get, you I mean, get controls from your driving, from your steering wheel. And that is the, the key, like being the, able to like do things really well there. Yeah. You know what Apple's yeah. going to do, though? I will tell you, I'm going to predict this and I believe I will be correct, mm -hmm. is Apple isn't going to charge you for car play. Apple is going to charge you for a package of emergency and assistance services yes. because they have the, the mm -hmm. satellite SOS via starting with the iPhone 14. Mm -hmm. uh, they said they wouldn't charge for a year, then they extended it. They are certain, and then they added emergency roadside SOS with uh, you have to have a certain AAA service in the U.S. So forth. Mm -hmm. They're so clearly going to have like a twenty month, twenty dollars a month, thirty dollars right. a month thing that's going to feature those two things plus whatever. And you have to have a newer phone, which gives you the incentive if you have your one or two generations behind. And then you will be paying them three or four hundred dollars a month. Maybe it'll be bundled with AAA in some way, and you'll be like, "This is great! I love it! I, you know, I'm never lost. I'm not on a weird rural road because my phone." Or my car is now tied in with emergency SOS or whatever, they will sell, I want to say, they'll sell fear I, I, I totally just like that. they did well, with the satellite I will service. Say, <laughs> I will say, as someone who who once was helped by AAA on the 5, yeah. Yeah. Um, which, oh, by the wow. way, everything's way bigger than you think it is when you're in the car, when you're standing mm -hmm. outside the car. Mm -hmm. oh, um, God. That was on, that was that, where AAA helped me, you know, in the middle of nowhere on the 5, uh, worth every penny. <laughs> so yeah. they, they tried so to great. you, but the one thing is, is that I was, I, I barely ever use it. And I remember that earlier that year, I thought, should I update this? Like I haven't used AAA and I don't remember how many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. My you wife was stuck at a ski it. area yeah. with the kids. My wife was stuck at a ski area with the kids where she'd driven from Seattle, not that far away, yeah. but a good hundred miles to go tubing. The clutch dies. We had a manual yeah. transmission. She calls AAA yeah. and they said, your, uh, sub, your plan doesn't include uh, extended whatever. Would you like that? And we paid Thirty dollars more, and they drove uh, yeah. two hundred miles for yeah. nothing. And we said we will never not have. Yeah. <laughs> but the fear totally part is it. Apple really marketed emergency SOS mm -hmm. as a, and I don't think unreasonably because it is a fear. We are do fear about people do take bigger chances. They are in places where there isn't coverage, and I think emergency SOS and emergency roadside assistance. I think uh, it's already saved lives. Satellite. Like there are already stories yeah. of people whose lives right. have been saved while they've been hiking oh, yeah. and stuff. So yeah. I, I think so what that'll you're saying, be the Glenn, subscription service. It's you're, like you're the fall detection right. and the, you know, yeah. Yeah. They'll, yeah, yeah, they'll package, you know, it'll be AFib and all this. It'll be CarPlay, CarPlay Plus will be, Plus you have the right phone like model that. and it's going to do all of these extra things and it will be integrated into the car as well as into your phone so you get the same services as long as you're carrying your phone with you and then everybody in the family needs to have an iPhone 14 or later. That's how it goes. Peace of mind package. Exactly. Peace of mind plus. I mean, all the car manufacturers already make you basically pay extra for, you know, remote right. security and remote support stuff. So yeah, yeah. Volvo has admit, like a similar thing. Yeah, That's also greatly affected my willingness to upgrade to a car. Like I mm -hmm. feel like I'm getting into a relationship with the car. Like I, right now I own cars that don't talk back to the manufacturer that do the thing that they need to do that get me from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit of a Luddite, but man, like the idea that now I'm now going to get hosed into, like I'm going to get pulled into like this, 
this uh, yes. subscription plan to run my car. Like I, uh, I'm, they're, you know, they're going, so, they're going a little crazy with the subscription plans and like how they can enable and disable features. It's it's the worst or, thing. Or I think or yeah, sell I your think data or gone. sell your data to the you saw the thing the the Lexus Nexus yeah. mm -hmm. data uh, situation where people didn't realize by approving one thing in the fine print they'd actually agreed to send all of their acceleration and hard braking and speeding information, which has affected uh, their insurance. Yeah. I mean that is the kind of trust you want to cultivate with your customers for a lifelong run. Uh, relationship as a car company just just, just awful i mean Crazy. real quick let, we, we should talk about like so apple's a whole it seems like the from the get-go the plan for the apple car a decade ago was kind of i, I guess like it was set up for failure because they were building up yeah. for true self-driving when everybody was chasing true self-driving and we've you know basically realized that that problem is harder to solve than if you everybody were so ever thought yeah. If you at the same time you were designing a headset that would allow you to watch movies, yes. a self driving car, <laughs> yes. really useful. Like the it's two totally of them coming together. If, 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 they had, totally if they had passed the if, if the if the receiver had been there when they threw the ball a long time ago, it would have been great. But it's perfect. I mean, listen, the car, you just go into Never Never Land and you get to LA. You know, like like the, that's a the that windscreen was, could have been a Vision Pro. That's, you don't that's even need the no, no, but just, yeah. just that's that you like would have the been, kids to use them. That's they wanted to get you away from like you don't have a steering wheel you don't have anything yes. else you sit in yes. this little minivan that is which to me was a dream is still mm -hmm. a dream is that i have a little apart little mini apartment that's you know that i can go into and i can like work a little bit and i can hang out a little bit yeah. and it's just moving me from one place to the other is the perfect car it's just that that's the last mile is super hard you know super, and that's the hard. that's the challenge yeah so the, so yeah so the early reports were that yeah this would be a steering wheel -less, uh vehicle just kind of a pod you hop in and which google take does you places Waymo. yeah with uh, pure self-driving, uh, the concepts that German reported on made it sound almost like a VW bug, or not bug, uh, the minibus. The bus, so yeah. like like a pod-shaped thing. Um, over at Engadget, Carissa Bell, our our reporter, just like fed a lot of the design prompts into into an AI image thing, and it came up with like this very cute bespoke Apple-looking thing. Uh, that was the plan. Clearly, that didn't go anywhere because nobody has fully cracked self-driving, no matter what Elon Musk calls it in Tesla's. Um, but the other problem is that I do feel like Tesla Tesla built the Apple car, unfortunately. Like Tesla did the thing that disrupted the car industry, made you right. give you a different way to buy it compared to everybody else, like put in the new tech that wasn't really anywhere else yet. Tesla did it. So now the idea of Apple doing a plain old electric car just seems redundant. Well, and I, think I think that's the ultimate I, thing. Yeah. Again, I think that the real problem is, is that the last mile is really hard. Mm -hmm. Like the, the streets and people and streets like that is yeah. like super complicated. And it is, you know, the, it's the typical problem where you end up spreading too little jam over too much bread. You know, it just, it just doesn't, it's never going to turn out. And, and so the problem is, is that it gets that they, they're trying to cover the last mile, whereas if you said all the highways, the companies are going to put all the billions of dollars that they've been trying to get working into the highway technology that allows the cars to really understand what's going on and gives them a bunch of telemetry and does all the things where you're going to drive when you get off the highway. But when you're on the highway, which is where we need it the most, it's going to do all the work for you. And it's super safe and it understands what those things are because it trying to figure out how to drive the back road in Pennsylvania, where I grew up would be impossible like like either and, and not counting the exactly. deer you know and so the so the um so the thing is is that solving that problem super mm -hmm. hard solving every highway more than th three lanes or more expensive but doable you know and the thing is is that the, the all the all or nothing is what really is getting everybody when it comes to this whereas what we really want to do is get on the five or get on the 101 and and have it do do the thing until until I get to until you until I, get off the, I will, I will tell I get you guys off. now um, with newer cars you basically do get that with like a modern like modern mm -hmm. uh, smart assisted cruise control stuff like uh, oh, Volvo has a thing but you, you hit can't a button, go to sleep yeah you I can't go to rental, sleep but I got a rental car recently don't have to do much work uh, yeah. And I, this is how I keep up on technology. I run a car uh -huh. from time to time. Yeah. And I plug my and I plug my iPhone, and I'm like, oh, that's what CarPlay Two looks like. And, <laughs> oh, it's very nice. I'm gonna be able to consider it. But I got one that was I felt it was smarter than I was. I mm -hmm. didn't know all the features, and I didn't. And it started to enable things on me, and I'm like, oh, this is actually uh, okay. This is all right. This is good. Like it's doing proper follow. I didn't know it could do that. It does mm -hmm. proper following distance when the car ahead of me slows down, so I can put on. I'm like, oh, and I was like, and then it was, oh, it's following the lane, so it's turning the steering yep. wheel. I was like, and this felt like a normal, I don't know, I had a Toyota or yep. something. So, and I thought, okay, this is, I had to turn features off because I wasn't, I wasn't compatible with the car. 
That's true. That's true. But most new cars, and especially as you go up higher end and like in trims and like other you know manufacturers and stuff, you do have like some basic stuff. So not full self driving, but listen, I sometimes do a five hour drive to like Savannah because I'm outside of Atlanta now, and to have just like. I'm just chilling. I'm just chilling the driving seat. Yeah. I'm holding the steering wheel, but I'm not like actually doing much is pretty great. So, and we can do that. I can't that even now comprehend that. Tech. It's amazing. Dementia. I can't, it's everything is so manual for me right now. I can't yeah. even comprehend that. It's so like, that's a like reason to upgrade everybody. Like yeah. for you guys. I'm a you, micro I, operator I, on everything. I, yeah. I think that the, the issue is, is that what, what scares me about that, and I've been in mm -hmm. some of those cars and I won't do it, is that is that if something goes wrong or if I have to take it over or if I have to make that, the problem is, is mentally going down, you know, shifting, yes. shifting into it. Right. Yeah. You know, they, I talked to a Boeing engineer a long time ago, not recently. <laughs> a um, good so, Boeing engineer. You know, but, yeah. but it, tightened all the screws. I was talking about uh, auto, this is back when they tightened the screws. Um, yes. And the, uh, and we were talking about the autopilot. I was like, how good is the autopilot? And he's like, oh, it, you know, it, it said, we have a little trouble with tax. This is back no, 20 mm -hmm. years ago, probably. And we had a little trouble with taxiing, but once you get to the runway, it can take off and land. Like it, it, it and I was like, so, and, and I said, how often do, do they actually use the auto land? He said, most of the time, once a month, you have to, you have to use it once a month to make sure that the system's working and you're overseeing it. And I was like, why do we have humans? Is it the hard one? Like the, when it hits the ground really hard, is that the one that's the autopilot? And he goes, no. He goes, it's the one that you barely feel like you touch the ground. Yeah. Like you just appear on the, on the floor. He goes, the pilots yeah. can't, can't do that. Like they can't do it that because they don't have enough. They don't, they can't see all the data at one time anyway. And then, and so I said, so why, uh, I, you know, we got into this discussion about why do you have the pilot still do it? And he goes, because if something goes wrong, the pilots still need to know how to do it. We don't want mm -hmm. them out of practice. So we want them to do it all the time. And occasionally you'll hear that, oh, we're going to do an instrument landing. That's because it's too cloudy. The pilots can't see it. And we're just going to turn the plane on and let the plane land because it can do it better than they can. But if we let the, do what well, we let the computer do it all the time the pilots will get out of practice and then we'll have planes hitting the ground and so that's what i work i think about that conversation a lot when i think for about sure, autopiloting sure. the car of getting this halfway in between where i'm like not really controlling it but i am controlling it uh, you know that that I think I think that's where it. a lot of manufacturers have landed. So the thing I have on the Volvo is called Pilot Assist, you know, and it's essentially, hey, I'm going to help you out. I'm not going to do it all for you, but right. I can do like I can follow cars. I can help you change lanes. I can keep you on the highway without mentally, you know, having your brain. At a pain the problem is what I really want is to be able to go to sleep. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, like, I there's a thing called to LA, you know, that's public really transit, but you need somebody to watch you when you're on public transit. So someone, no one steals your wallet. That's well, we the, need that I mean, train. Well, we need that, that, that high speed train between LA and San Francisco. Oh yeah. Then you what, get a $30 sleeper. $30 billion dollars or a hundred billion dollars or something like that. You get a I'm, sleeper, uh, sleeper uh -huh. car on your uh, high speed train. I was in New York I'm for 10 years. So yeah. let me tell you guys, like, I don't, I actually miss spending an hour on the subway to get to work because that was such a great time where I'm not driving. Yeah. I'm not like doing the thing, but I can read. Yeah, it's great I can like time. decompress. I can take a nap. You can nap on the subway and like you're smart about it. Like it's if you're sitting on your wallet, it's very hard for somebody to steal your wallet. It's true. You know? There's so, always people pressed up around. Yes, this, yes. We got light rail in Seattle uh, several mm -hmm. years ago and it's not very far from my house. And I went from somebody we just didn't have. We had bus transit. It's all it's inefficient, but goes, you know, locally mm -hmm. it's good. And then suddenly it's like I can go to the airport. I don't have to drive there. I have to park there. It was, it's so life, -changing life changing as a family and a traveler. It's just like, oh, I, I so had, good. I had four days where there was like two days I was in the East Coast and I went up and down between Boston and New York and Washington, D.C. And I had all these meetings. And in each one of those, oh, I just fun. took the sub, I took mass transit mm -hmm. um, and I just bounced around everywhere I needed to go. And then I flew to L.A. and spent two hours on the 405, <laughs> like, like, you know, like in a car, in a rental car, just going, this is, and, and this, you know, just, just like, oh, no. Oh, you didn't take the subway in Los Angeles that goes almost nowhere that's uh, useful nowhere. for anybody? I don't nowhere. know. I don't yeah, know what it think goes from I Santa Monica to downtown, I think. Yeah, exactly. That's for some people. I prefer and with my car yeah mm -hmm. and bigly like jr just took it to the uh, oscars so uh that was you know he's dedicated took the subway yeah. and the bus he is dedicated yeah right? I'm, a, I'm a local oh, yeah i'm a local driver i'm not like i mean i definitely go on some trips but obviously i'm not i don't want to go into the city that being said i drove into the city today and it was you know as awful as always i but I, feel for you. Uh, yeah. I, I i don't I, I mean this is like another thing i'm perfectly happy using my old-fashioned phone clipped to the vent mm -hmm. and i agree it's not a problem one random thing I just want to bring up, and I don't know if I'm the only person, um, I use Google Maps because yep. I want to use Google Maps. Yeah. It is such a, it, to all these years, I just want to know why it's such a bizarre map while driving, even though it's intended for driving. Uh -huh. If there's a, if there's yeah. a change, um, if there's anything in your route, 
the map kind of spins and turns around and does this like weird <laughs> flip. And I go, what? That's the last thing in the world you yeah, while that. driving is for the map to start spinning and, I, and I, pulling I, out. And I go, why? Like I'm, people will say use ways, but I go, what? It's not designed for driving, and yet it is clearly yeah, designed, it's not for driving. designed for driving. Yeah, I don't yeah, I understand it. I would not use Apple Maps when I first tried it out, oh, and then I was like, terrible. "I'm not going to use Apple yeah. Maps. It's terrible." But the problem is now it is significantly better as yes. a app than Google Maps, and I hate saying that because it's just like because I, I was using Google Maps <laughs> since it was like since it came out, like yeah. you know, and I. Um, I have to admit the goofy look of ways kind of kept me away from using it, but now the Apple map, the Apple one is so good. Mm -hmm. It's integrated. It tells me where every, I mean, it tells, you what tells lane me where to every be radar, yeah. oh, like there's so a, nice. there's a Jesus police officer crazy. right there, you know, like, sorry yeah. for the police officer. I just don't like, trust an Apple maps. I still don't trust the, the, um, the route recommendations or the, oh, I've had them both. And so I've had both fine because I've. I've I'll had it them. feel weird and then Google Maps will definitely micromanage me too much. And then right. I'll like, you know, try to get off one exit to save like 1.5 minutes. And, but I, I guess, yeah. Apple I even Maps. have Apple Maps will get me off the highway onto a city street to bypass the clog. And then I drive yeah. around and back on the highway. And I'm like, once it started doing that, I was like, this is actually Apple Maps started to teach me shortcuts in Seattle, even though I've lived here for 30 plus years. <laughs> and once I, once the maps are teaching me shortcuts, I'm like, all right, they have, they have, I will now trust them because they're doing but better for me. The I'm hard still thing was, was not Apple Maps. I can't, I can't, I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm it's just Google it's, Maps person. Yeah. It, and again, it was for me, it was just like, well, Google Maps is way better. And, and, but it got to a point where I started testing and what happened was, and this is how Apple gets you. I got a new phone and I, as I said, I don't install things until I feel like I need them. And what happened was people kept on sending me links oh, to yeah. something and I'd click into Apple Maps. And this is probably four or five years after they were released. And I started going, ah, oh, this isn't that bad. I'll give it a shot. Like that was the, but it was four or five years after they released the first Apple Maps that I was yeah. like willing to turn it on because people were just sending me links. And when you click on it, it automatically gets yeah. you there um, and, and puts you into Apple Maps. And I was like, oh, it's way better than I remembered it. And now the problem is I'm totally, you know, totally tied in now. And it's, and, it's, and it's, it's smarter and it's in so subtle much easier. ways. As an Apple user, the problem yeah. is also is that it's really easy. It's You have to really think about using Google Maps because mm -hmm. you click on links, you do things, and it automatically just takes you to Apple Maps. And, and it, you have to really want to use Google Maps to, to use them. And that's the, you know, that's the challenge. What is nice about Apple Maps is that uh, the driving experience is better because it can tell you, hey, you need to be in the second right lane. Yeah. for you to make this specific like turn and Google Maps never does that in city driving. Maybe occasionally it'll do that in highway driving, but once yeah, in a while highway. Quite, yeah. Yeah. Once in a while it'll do that. But Apple Maps is like very specific, very much like, especially if you're in, in an unfamiliar city or something, it's the perfect way to go. So, okay. Do you guys have any other thoughts about like the Apple CarPlay or Apple's car ambitions at this point? Well, I like that Europe was pushing back on the uh, no buttons, no dials. Yes. Thing, right? Oh, good God. So, yes. So I'm like, when I saw the Apple, when I saw these rumors come out before about Apple taking kind of taking over mm -hmm. the dashboard and along with, you know, the Tesla approach, like I, there's a lot of reasons why I don't want to own a Tesla, but one of them is I don't like the whole, uh, you know, I don't want to drown in a lake is one the of touch them. Touchscreen is bad. Allegedly. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but it's also, <laughs> I, uh, you know, hasn't been proven. That was the reason why just to a disclaimer. Um, but uh, I, I, I want, physical buttons, even if they're fly by wire sort of things, because I want to have the discrete feel and not the haptics. I want mm -hmm. the nature of it. And I want to be able to learn the position. And my hand always goes to the same place. And all that I've seen with the interface is they seem to deny uh, however many hundred years or more of ergonomics and, and the processing of uh, interaction with mechanical devices by having things change in position to require close scrutiny, right? When you should be looking at the street. So I, I don't want an, I don't want a CarPlay system mm -hmm. that removes buttons, um, but I'd, I'd take one that was integrated with with dials. And give buttons. give us buttons. The the whole touchscreen digital, digital crown. crown. Is the worst. Just give a lot of digital crowns. Digital crown. Everything is a digital. Right. The whole steering wheel is a digital crown. <laughs> Every I mean. digital crowns everywhere. I I think that I think <laughs> it is interesting that that you mentioned Vision Pro and the car because I I, I think. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, cars and air headsets are solving for the same thing down yep. the road, and I think that. It might be interesting to have Vision Pro out there for a long time to inform them on, you know, you got LiDAR, you've got like awareness, like all the proximity elements of this and the perceptual, like you're in this giant moving kind of perceptual bubble and the way that car interfaces need do actually need to evolve probably mm -hmm. with that, with heads up awareness. 
And I feel like maybe the, the, the world of AR headsets can inform that. I remember talking with like Microsoft about that at one point. And like, mm-hmm. you know, some people to remember edge computing, it began, I began to realize like, yeah, if you're solving for, you know, headsets that are doing full sensory awareness and spatial awareness, then you're, you're also working on solving for like self-driving vehicles, possibly for robotics, for like the physical things. So that's my only thought there is I that think- there probably is an interconnected part. I'm, I'm going to make my bold prediction that yeah. by 2040, we have the Apple personal air car. Like they, <laughs> this is not, they're not doing, they're not giving up on the car. They just decided <laughs> to give up on the roads. Go straight like, to the like, so so yeah. if we're still doing this in 2040, oh. you'll be able to hold, keep me honest. You know, we'll be like, so we, we can use the, we don't need go, roads go, back go, to the future we're, we're thing going, again. Yeah, it's back to the yeah. future seven is uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Apple air, air car. For the headset, they're going to use it for the air car. I really want the heads up uh, windscreen. I mean, I'm not kidding about it as I think one of the things that would promote a lot of safety is to have a windscreen that had AR on it that would provide yeah. more information where you're not looking down or looking to the side and my wife has a vision condition where she can no longer drive at night but she's perfectly safe to drive during the day if she had a heads up display if the windscreen did night vision she could drive it'd be perfectly you know safe right. you have to hope that it doesn't go out in the middle of driving on a highway is the only downside but there's lots of uh i think enhancements safety enhancements and low visibility driving in fog i mean like the instrument rating on a plane you could drive reduction car. Yeah, yeah all these things yeah. right but that's uh, i'd love to see a vision pro i wasn't I'm kidding i said turn the vision pro into the car i think is a great idea all right uh let's let's hop back to leo for one more word from our sponsors you know uh thank you devendra one of the things that happens when we travel when we're in mexico is we want to watch you know baseball games in Mexico that are not on in Mexico, or we want to watch content that's not available in Mexico, news and things like that. But, you know, I never worry because I just fire up ExpressVPN and suddenly I can see whatever I want. I could be in America. I can be in England. I could be in Japan. ExpressVPN lets me travel the world without leaving my house. Plus, of course, it keeps me safe. It is the best VPN. Watching Netflix without using ExpressVPN, well, that would be like buying a, tickets to a Taylor Swift concert and leaving after the opening act. No, you didn't. You came to see Tay Tay. How does ExpressVPN unblock content? Well, because when you fire it up, it lets you choose your online location. Now, sometimes you're just going to say, well, give me the nearest, fastest server. But sometimes you're going to want to go to another country so you can get Netflix or other streaming websites like BBC iPlayer or YouTube to think you're in that country and give you content you can't get where you are. It is great for traveling. In fact, it's a must for traveling just for security alone. You open the app, you select the country name you want to be in, and then tap a button and connect and you're done. When you refresh the page, you're there. Why else choose ExpressVPN? Well, they invest in their network, so they've got blazing fast speeds. I mean, this wouldn't be any good if you couldn't watch video in HD with zero buffering. Well, you can with ExpressVPN. Try that with some other VPNs. It works with every device you've got, iPhone, Android, laptops, desktops, media consoles, smart TVs. You can even put it on some routers, and they sell routers that can run ExpressVPN and protect your whole house. With servers in 94 different countries, there's pretty much nowhere you can't be with ExpressVPN, which means you're going to get access to thousands of new shows. You better believe I brought it with me to Cabo for vacation. I bring it with me when I travel every time. Be smart. Stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of the content. Get your money's worth. Get safe. Get secure with ExpressVPN. Go to expressvpn.com slash twit. And when you do that, expressvpn.com slash twit, you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free when you buy a one-year package. That's the best deal. expressvpn.com slash twit. Twits, the only VPN I use, expressvpn.com slash twit. And now I shall reverse my VPN, go back to Cabo, and let you take over for the rest of the show. Thanks to Vindra. Big yes. cheer for everybody. All hail the great explorer of Mars who has found a volcano, a big whacking volcano that's been sitting in plain sight since at least 1971 when Mariner and I was imaging the planet. Previously on Twit, this week in space. This is the place that we had proposed uh, as a possible human landing site. By being 
at a volcanic site that might still be active today with ice that might still be preserved from the latest eruption, you have, in my view, a real good chance of finding uh, life that might still be alive on Mars. MacBreak Weekly. MacBook Air came out. I have them here. I wrote a review of this on Six Colors. They are what you'd expect. They're as fast as the M3 iMac. I put them on my desk with two displays and a lid closed MacBook Air. And guess what? It drove two studio displays. On hands-on windows, we're going to take a look at one of the latest folding PCs and try to figure out if folding PCs are the future of the platform. And so you can put this on the stand like you would with the HP foldable. PC and you can and it falls off <laughs> and this is the problem this week in Google Dahl was surprised in 2022 when the cost of his car insurance skyrocketed by 21% LexisNexis sent him a 258 page consumer disclosure report and what it contained stunned him. It included the dates of 640 trips, the distance driven, and an accounting of any speeding, hard braking, or sharp accelerations. This is about evil data brokers and evil insurance companies. The data is going to be out there. You can forbid it being collected. You can forbid it being used for insurance. That's what legislators are for. Twit. Leo says hi. Thank you so much, Leo. So we're going to go from Apple to Microsoft. And something is happening this week that I think most people in the tech community are absolutely not aware of. But uh, in the tech press, we have to pay attention to all the big events. Microsoft announced it's going to have a Surface and AI event this week. And, you know, over at Engadget, we're preparing how to cover that. I'm hearing rumblings that it's not entirely a consumer event, that this is going to be kind of an enterprise event to you. I think it's tied to Ignite, uh, their enterprise conference. But... It does make me think, like, what what is going on with Surface? What do we think about all of Microsoft's AI ambitions at this point? I've been testing out Copilot and Copilot Pro and haven't been, like, super, you know, excited or inspired by any of it. And I also think Microsoft is kind of dropping the ball a bit on Surface. Um, last year, we got a new Surface Laptop Studio, a new Surface Laptop Go. They're expected to introduce a new Surface Pro, uh, the Surface Pro 10. Um, that's the hybrid, you know, tablet slash uh, laptop and then a new Surface laptop, the plain, the plain old laptop. I feel like, you know, Microsoft is just kind of uh, given up a bit on the whole Surface tablet dream. Uh, what do you guys think? I don't know why it's taken everybody mm -hmm. so long to make the tablet hybrid laptop happen. It yeah. seems yeah. like... Well, maybe it like shouldn't happen go, at I've this been, point. Yeah. Maybe. But then on the other hand, I feel like, you know, like, you know, Apple selling an iPad and also a laptop and it's getting to the point where I go, why do you carry both? And then you get to the point where Microsoft, like in the Panay years, you, I, I remember when they first had the, um, there were, there were different types and you had the student, you had the surface and you also had the, the surface that went into the laptop base and they weren't the same surface. And then you go, okay, well, surface book. Yeah. Yeah. The surface book. And you go, well, why aren't those the same? So like the modular thing was not modular and like they will we'll get there eventually, but like, mm -hmm. you know, Panos is no longer there. And, um, you know, and so I, I, I just look at it from afar, like going, I'm, I'm baffled by that, but I'm also really curious about the AI part, like you said, because mm -hmm. I think I find in my everyday use with AI, I was just talking about this the other day at length, but um, I just feel it is an experimental dabbly thing for me. Mm -hmm. And maybe people will go, oh, you're not a power user. And I go, okay, well, maybe that's true, but the you're way it surfaces- You're a power user, Scott. Like you're in probably. Tech, you know? Yeah, if that's true. a power user, all of us in this room are, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, but, but then, you know, I admit that I'm not like, you know, mm -hmm. programming and I'm not like, sure, you know, sure. doing like, you know, video edits or whatever, but then, um, how it, sur how it surfaces, so to speak, in what you do, the very discrete uses of AI. Like I was looking at this story and there was one point that it brings up uh, midway through about like a rewind app that could go back into your history. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was super fascinating because I feel like in browsers we have this, but then we don't have it for the rest of the, it's a little, again, a slippery slope because mm -hmm. do I really want it to know everything I'm doing? But I like the idea of it being a memory for me. I thought, oh, that's a use for AI. I find that it's very hard for me to find uses for AI that aren't drifty replacements for things that I'm already doing elsewhere. And so I want, I want it to be like, well, show me what I'm, oh, yeah, what I'm got, doing. I got yeah. three. I got three. None of them are really LLM per se, though. Is that's the thing? Is LLM? I think is hard. Is AI transcription? Uh, it's 
gotten Beautiful. extremely good mm-hmm. and um i'm sure we all use it in different ways and yeah, you know yeah. i have to have to trust and verify right you have to go back and you want to get a ver- verbatim quote but for searching text oh my god i can now do i did an article last summer where i did i don't know 20 plus hours of interviews and to find what i needed would have been it would have been totally unachievable or cost a thousand dollars in transcription and i paid mm-hmm. twenty dollars to a service one of the better ones uh so ai transcription uh uh the way that Adobe has integrated AI is varied across all its products, but I'll say edge detection for doing silhouetting is uh, and uh, object recognition is unbelievable now compared to where it was before. Uh, it's not perfect, but it is. It's just staggering when it works well. And uh, the third one is I don't do that much coding anymore, but when I, I I'm like doing a website, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, the eternal golden braid, and I can't remember how to do something, and I just ask chat GPT 3.5 or four. And it says, Oh, here's how you do it. And it gives me the starting point. It gives me the code. I haven't used copilot for co coding, Mm -hmm. but even just the, I need to do this thing. My SQL, I can't remember the, you know, arcane sequence. I need to do a MySQL query that does this. And it's like, here's all your left joins. So those are three (laughs) discrete things that have saved me from, let's say minutes to dozens or maybe even hundred of hours in the last year and none of them involve generative AI per se. That, that's right. true. Those are true power user moves. Uh, I will say um, I'm using it for transcribing interviews. We also just uh, put up a transcription of the Engadget podcast. And I was trying to figure mm. out like, the best way to do that. And I've been using Mac Whisper on my Mac. So it's all done locally yeah. too. Oh, that's sending great. stuff out to the service. And it is so good. I have to go in and like fix some things, but it takes 15 minutes as opposed to, I don't know, three to four hours to hand transcribe something that long. So yeah, that stuff can be pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that like, I, I suddenly realized that this pathway that I use to, uh, I, you know, I do a lot of presentations and mm-hmm. keynote and I really, I really love using mid journey for funny. Like the problem is you get something too heavy and you want to have something kind of funny in there into your, into your presentation just to lighten things up and still keep on talking about what you're doing. And so I use mid journey all the time. I'm like, and, and I have in the style of Pixar is a really popular one for me. Like I have a, I want a confused guy or I want a guy. I had one talking about why, I don't like open mics in presentations. Uh, like when I'm at an event, I try to get rid of all the open mics. Then I have this, and all I typed in was know-it-all uh, with glasses yelling into a 50s style mic with a stand, you know. And I get this, I said, over a plain white background, 20% padding, right? So then I get this guy yelling. I got a whole bunch of them. I made hundreds of them before I got to the one I wanted, but it all took about 15 minutes. And I've got hundreds of versions of this. And then, but the problem is, eh, it's not perfect. So I take it and then I, um, I run it through Hope has photo AI. So then I take it and I make it four times the resolution. So I get a big, really, really high resolution. Now it's like 10,000 by something or other. Then I take it into Photoshop and I use the generative AI to say, remove the background. And so it takes out the, the white, mostly white background, makes a couple little errors and I fix that really quickly. And then I, um, and then I scale it down to, t- to 1920 high because that's the biggest I'll ever want it. And that, that bicubic sampling will make it all like blend together. So now it just looks like this beautiful you know, image that I could never buy somewhere you know, of the, exactly what I wanted. And I do that. I mean, and that take that whole process that I talked about just takes like three or four minutes, you know, like, a, you know, like it's like 15 minutes of me making a hundred of them and then three or four minutes max to get it, to get it all to where it, where it needs to go. And I get these beautiful images that I get to put in people. I have to admit, sometimes it's a distraction. I'll get to the end of a presentation and people <laughs> go, I don't know what, what, what we're going to do with that project, but how did you do those images? Like, where did you find them? What's the stock Wrong art focus. that you're using? I'm like mid journey. Um, so, uh, and, but I think that the other thing for me is that uh, I try to use it a lot because I'm trying to figure out how it thinks, you know, because I, I think that a lot of times I don't know how I'm going to use it. So I just use it. So for instance, everything I cook now is chat GPT. Like I'm like, you are, and the key is I've learned is you got to tell it where it's coming from and where you're going. And so you mm-hmm. go, I, I'll say you are a, a Michelin star, a three Michelin star French chef. Give me, uh, I would like a decadent decadent is a really good word. When you're te- when you tell chat GPT <laughs> decadent, it means I don't care about time. I just want uh-huh. it to be great. And so that's what, so you learn what, what it lifts into. Right. And, uh, and I say, give me a decadent on- French onion soup. And it just, I have to admit I made it and now I can't, unmake like i can't go to restaurant i i order oh, i love no. french onion soup 
I go to every restaurant. It's the best French onion soup that I've had outside of Paris, you know, and, and I, and I can't now go to order it anywhere because I'm, I can make it better at home. And so with uh, chat GPT, so I, all my little recipes now, all my soup recipes and other recipes and everything else, I'm just like, show me how to make this. Um, but what I've also found it really useful for is I'm trying to explain something complicated and I say, you are, you know, you are the, you know, like, um, oh, yeah. you are, you are this expert, explain this to a f fifth grader or explain this to an eighth grader. And sometimes I'll ask, like, do it to a fifth grader, an eighth grader, a, a, um, a you know, a, a senior, a, a graduate student, and it will reform that in seconds into an entirely different way that it describes it based on what it thinks it's, you, again, you have to have, it's a very simple logic function. Where are you starting? What are you doing? Where are you going? You know, what is the output to it? And if you give it those three things, you end up with these great, I mean, like it just helps me. And, and what happens, I don't use any of them, but what I do is it's as reference, it gives me new thoughts about how to use a metaphor or how to use, like how to explain something to, um, you know, uh, how to explain something to somebody. And I'm, because the fifth grader one might be sound condescending, but it simplified something. And again, as someone who knows it, where, where I think it gets dangerous is when you're asking it things you don't know. Right. Like if you don't know the, and you can't cross check that is right. where it becomes dangerous because it's telling you things that, you know, like sometimes it just puts things out and I go, mm -hmm. yeah, no, but there's been, but there have been times where like, I, like Amazon's got its own little AI thing when you're in AWS and I find that the chat GPT explanations of how to use AWS are better than <laughs> AWS's little chat, you know, AI function. So I'll go into chat GPT and I'm like, I need to, I need to stream something and I need to, I need to stream it from one media live to this media connect. And this is what I got here in, in AWS and boom, it just explains like the whole process to yeah, me. So. It feels like small, like well-defined domains work really well with LLM where you're like, yeah. here's a set of information. Tell me something about this set of information instead of yeah. in, give me an answer from all of what you know and create something They're I think they're relatively terrible at that. Oh, and, um, I, I use it for medical information. I don't rely on it as a diagnosis, but I'll get a test right. result back. It will use technical terminology. I don't understand. I'll search on it. It doesn't give me insight because it's still technical. And I'll say, tell me this for like a college graduate level understanding of someone who never took biology and it'll give me an answer like oh now i can look up the term like this exactly. sounds reasonable now i will confirm i'll go look up the terms to make sure it's telling me the correct thing and then i look that up and it, in fact then i find the technical terminology in it but this is before my doctors had a chance to interpret the results or, or whatever and i feel like i'm it'll go to you know then i go to mayo and clinic or whatever but it, i know what i'm looking for it gets into one of those things where a lot of times you have to be around a lot of people that know something before you mm. understand the terminology you don't even even know how That's to good. say it like it's it's like this thing and what chat gpt is, eliminates for me is the need to do that like i'll go through it That's and great. i know that it's i can sit there and, and talk to it all the time about something i don't understand then when i go to talk to people about it there's a whole bunch of terms in there that that i that i i i, I can start to triangulate when i'm you know because i'm i'm fortunate enough because of the, the office hours and other things I'm around a lot of experts, you know, and so, and, um, and so I, I can, but I don't even know, sometimes I don't even know how to ask the question. So right. it kind of helps me set that up, um, you know, in that process. And then it also does things like when I interview, we have a, an interview show we do with, uh, uh, Michael Krasny. I don't, Michael Krasny used to do a, a forum for KQED. And sometimes I'm trying to think about questions that we could ask we won't use those questions, but I sit there and I go in there and I go, um, like ask me, you know, uh, 20 thoughtful questions for Geraldo Rivera, you know, something like that. And it'll ask a whole bunch of questions and, you know, most of them are not useful at all, but some of them are like, Oh, I like where, I like where it's going there. Sorry about that. I got a little, <laughs> but we need to update. Uh, Alex needs yeah. to be updated. Yeah. My, my, Alex my, <laughs> my telestrator needed to be updated. So anyway, so the, um, uh, so, but I, but so for brainstorming, I find it to be incredibly valuable and for making, you know, images again, the journey is something I use a lot and the, and the generative AI and in Photoshop, I get scared again, in the same way we were talking about before with auto driving, you know, they, you know, the saying is, you know, to error is human, but to really screw things up requires a, a, a computer, you know? And so, you know, the thing that I always get worried about is us taking our hands off of the, uh, off of the steering wheel sure. and allowing yeah. the AI to kind of run with it because it's not because I'm worried about someone taking over the world or anything else. I'm just worried it's going to make huge mistakes and we're going to make huge decisions based on information that, that is, you know, it's yeah. hallucinating. And I, I think it's already, it already has been. There are reports of people who have been, you know, writing emails and things like that based on just like an, an AI 
an LLM result and it's had errors in there and they didn't check. Like they wouldn't fact check. They didn't check like oh names God. and certain things are correct. And people are just like putting it out there. Yeah. So it I'm does, wondering like, do, I will tell you if, if you do check, it make does great cover letters. Like I'm oh, not a very good great. cover letter person because I find them to be superfluous. And so I just go, here's all the stuff I want to say in the cover letter, write a cover letter and it writes great. it. Now I might, I'll go through and edit a couple things, mm -hmm. but it, its tone is way better than mine because mine is mostly like this is a big waste of time and I'm I can't believe I write it. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, no. screw screw cover letters. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm more wondering: is it? Do you, we think it's wise for Microsoft to go all in on this stuff as it has, like spending oh. over ten billion dollars on OpenAI, essentially being yeah. its biggest shareholder? Like to me, all I see oh. is like the wor the worry of this, right? Because Copilot within Windows, it's nice to have, but it really takes power users to really like dig into like what it does so well but i don't know what a general right. windows user is going to do I, with this thing well i can i, I can yeah. I, I i don't know what's going to happen i have no right. information about this but my guess is when i saw it and they're going to talk about ai with surface mm -hmm. the idea that your computer could have all the information that you're creating on it and locally not on the cloud but locally have all that information in an llm and mm -hmm. have you be able to use plain text to interrogate all the information that you've created or that you have on your computer, all the PDFs you downloaded, all the other things, tell me about this and tell me where it is. Like, you know, so tell me, tell me about this and tell me where it is, but you can't quite, you don't know where it is. Like there's things I can't find. Like there's some file somewhere. I, right. I Being able to open up my computer on, on a surface, let's say, and be able to say, there was a file that I, that I, I wrote this letter to somebody or I, I created this file that had this name in it. Can you show me where that is? You know, you know, and it just tell, you know, it knows where all those things are. That would be a huge, you know, or tell me about this. And I've got all these PDFs about, you know, I don't know, uh, CMEs. You know, I, I have a lot of PDFs about coronal mass ejections for a variety of reasons. So, so, so the, uh, um, <laughs> we'll, so you'll, we'll all find out one day why <laughs> yes, or, or not, <laughs> if, if, it, if it happens, you won't find anything out. So it'll, it'll all just be dark. So anyway, so the, um, but the, uh, uh, but tell me about this or tell me about when did, when was the Carrington event? And then it just goes in and just goes, finds that and says, it was in 1859 or whatever. So, um, it tells me exactly where and when, and that the telegraph fire, things caught fire and all these other things, but I can ask it those things without actually having to search and read. I that just ask it for information. That would be very yeah. valuable, especially being if it some was sort local. Of, yeah. Being like a collective, those, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Like the, the collective memory thing is interesting mm -hmm. and it also feels like, we have also like PCs trying to still catch up and be more like phones. Like I like the landscape uh, growing more together because they kind of split a bit and, you know, and, and as the, the Silicon becomes a little more similar and you get to the point where more, like you say, on more on device things are able to be done. That's, 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 that's exciting. Privacy is a big deal. Yeah. And then, and then also like, yeah, trusting that you've, you've got this enclosed system that you can work with or that you can understand the the clutter of what you've got because I I also find that you know in the past ten years the way I've lived and and I I think it's probably common that um, the organizational systems have have deteriorated you know there's much more <laughs> sprawl there's much more clutter um, you know the the days of like putting everything into special folders and tagging stuff oh, there's a lot of desktop folders, folders that you just grab everything from the desktop and put it <laughs> yeah, in a folder and I'll not, get back to that at some point I, I'm up to it's not happening. Yeah, so, right. It's like Gmail culture where it's, yeah, it's like everything that, you know, the mail is just a sprawl and I search for it. But exactly. Like if you can apply kind of what I'm doing in, in mail or on, on, the, on a browser to the whole OS and all the things on it, I uh, like what. And, like yeah, and again, if, it, like, if it was watching, if it's watching that in the background, again, local on your computer, I think that is a big deal for companies, for enterprise, for all these things is this is happening on your home computer and it's making mm -hmm. decisions, but it could remind you like, Hey, you said you were you in an email or Discord or whatever. You said you were going to do this, this, and this, and it's Tuesday and it's due tomorrow. Are you going to do anything about that, or do you want to like, <laughs> yeah, like you know, but, pro, but baby. like, yeah, but it, but it, but just, uh, yeah. just reminding you because there's a lot of things we just forget. Yeah, like you absolutely. know, hey, you might want to like, uh, you know, the eclipse is coming up and you thought you were going to be in Austin. Uh, you might want to get a ticket. You know, like get a like ticket, they, get they're glasses, getting pretty expensive. All that stuff, Glenn. You were going to say something. Oh, I, I have a very brief answer, which is the uh, should should Microsoft go all in on this they should spend 
as a huge amount of money like they are because this could be the most exciting and transformative thing that's happened in the history of computing since whenever, right? Sure. Absolutely. Should they deploy it for consumers and businesses as a customer <laughs> product that's, that's trustable and should be out there right now? Mm-hmm. No, absolutely not. Everyone is this, jumping yeah. out on that. But everyone should be, there's all this money in tech, right? There's, I mean, multi-trillion mm-hmm. dollar companies, multi-trillion dollar companies like Apple should, and Microsoft, should they be putting money into, uh, should Apple have spent a billion or whatever dollars for a decade on the Apple car. Yes. Should they be investing in AI? Absolutely. But there seems to be a discretion factor where they're freaked out about not being leading yeah. out there in the market, which I think they should pull back in. But they should be spending all this money. Absolutely should be spending all this money. I mean, that, that's what they exist for, right? To to do this groundbreaking work. But yeah. I, I kind of agree. Like, I've talked to a lot of Microsoft executives. Like, I bring up my issues with this. I'm like, guys, these things are not always accurate. You are putting this tool in people's hands, which could be spitting out garbage back to them, and they may end up using it in their work. And I would say, like, you know, if I hired an employee who kept giving me wrong information, I would fire them. And Microsoft just tends to be like, well, you know, we're in a growing phase and mistakes will happen. And we will tell people this is all like we are just trying to learn. Right. This is all we'll, kind we'll of a just keep test. generating yeah. multiracial Nazis until yeah. we get it right. Does not <laughs> seem like a great strategy. There, there seems like a lot wrong with this strategy. Are, what do you guys think about the the idea of a Surface tablet PC at this point? Are you over the idea? Because I think even Microsoft is over the idea. And I think <laughs> the history of computers, like so far, I think my favorite laptop is the MacBook Air, the new MacBook Air, the M2 and the M3. Perfect computers. It doesn't need to be a tablet. This seems yeah. slightly off base, but Devendra, uh-huh. have you seen uh, Federico Vitici's at uh, Mac Stories? He created a Franken uh-huh. device. It's a hybrid yes, yeah. Mac iPod, yes. iPad that he built together, and he calls it the uh, hybrid Mac iPad laptop and tablet that Apple won't make. So if we wanted to know what the best in class today might look like, not exactly, mm-hmm. you can see it. I, and I, you go, oh, well, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> that's literally, yeah, like I sketched yeah. this out in a piece that was like six years ago. Exactly, yeah. like exactly. That's the thing I've I've written like a billion articles about that I go, I, I gave up on Apple doing that, but I still feel like it's going to happen in like yeah. a frog uh, lowering into the pot it, it uh, type of way. Mm-hmm. But the problem is that I exactly I love the idea of the MacBook Air, like laptops are still incredibly useful. The, the problem with the Surface tablet is I don't feel like Microsoft, it's kind of a common problem. I also feel with Microsoft and handheld mm-hmm. gaming, which mm-hmm. is a separate thing, but I don't feel like they made the tablet ecosystem good enough yes. for them. Or Windows and good that's enough the for problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's not that, you know, App, Apple did the split strategy where it's like the iPad has a great ecosystem that works for a lot of people with that, but it's super annoying that it doesn't communicate with mm-hmm. the laptop. And it, or it does, but it's not the same thing. And so you go, I have two things growing closer that aren't the same thing. But Microsoft has two of the same operating systems, but one is is made for laptops and the other is not really great for tablets still. And that that's the problem too, is it's like tablet, but for what? I I, I think, I think like looking at Apple solution right now is like, if you want a tablet with a keyboard, you buy an iPad and you get a keyboard case. And if you want a good laptop, you get a MacBook of, of any kind. And maybe you should just have both because if you have an iPad and you put it next to your Mac, it becomes a second display problem solved. And you the, know, you yeah. know, I think that it's also for a certain generation because, mm-hmm. you know, when I look at my, you know, my parents spend very little time and my kids spend very little time on laptops. Like they, you know, my kids yeah. have Chromebooks for school, which they would love to throw into the pool. I tell them, no, <laughs> it's bad for the water. Um, so they, you know, so the Chromebooks are not like, I think that probably did more damage than Google knows to their mm. whole brand as to a, to an entire generation, because what they connected, what they connect iPads to is fun stuff that they do. And what they yes. connect Chromebooks to is death. You know, like it is like, it is so <laughs> like they, they hate those Chromebooks so much. And partially it's just because of the nature of being at school and all your homework mm. is there. And partially because they don't work very well. You know, they're really cheap. Laptops, yes. you know, like, so laptops, they're, they're all, yeah. And the problem is, is that if you're, if you're at home and you have an iPad, you're just used to all these things that the iPad does. And then you have this little Chromebook that doesn't do anything, you know, and so other than schoolwork, you know, and so, um, but I think that uh, a lot of people, you go to an airport and you see it, you see the kind of generational thing where there's a lot of folks that are at a certain generation that, or, and a lot of people that just don't like when I open up, mm-hmm. when I go to the airport, I will 
use my iPad until I need to use my laptop, you know, and um, I take both, both of them. I have a, you know, I have an Air or not a Pro, you know, MacBook mm-hmm. Pro and a, and a, and they're all both stuffed together. And I pull out my, and I generally will only pull out the laptop if I get forced into it. And that's usually because I need the files. I need to have, you know, there's a, I need to have a couple pro things that are there and I don't like opening up the laptop. Um, but I, but I generally prefer my iPad, but I, but I, again, there is a whole generation that isn't using laptops at all, you know, like for their regular stuff other than schoolwork. And there's a whole generation above that at the 60 and above, I think when you see it in an airport, not to be, I mean, just to be saying like, when you look at it, 60 and above, uh-huh. everyone's on iPads, like not, uh-huh. you know, except for the road warriors or whatever, almost everybody's just using an iPad. And, and, and so I think that, um, it depends on what you need because it, it really is great to have a sandbox that isn't opened, that is safe, that mm-hmm. relatively compared to everything else that you can't like when, you know, my, my parents got a PC and I was like, unless, you, are you sure you want to do that? Because yeah, you're yeah. not technically capable of keeping it safe, but you know, I, like, I you know, and, and so yeah. that, you know, that's the, I mean, that's the, I, I'd much prefer people to be in a, mm-hmm. that, that aren't going to do the engineering work to be in a computer that's relatively got lots of rails around it so yeah. that you can do the thing. Cause all they're doing is word processing. This speaks to the, 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 like the I think the ingenious, I guess, way the Apple handle, or maybe they just kind of stumbled into this, right? They built a really good tablet and a good tablet experience. They've already had great laptops. They just keep those things siloed and just running in parallel. Basically, I don't feel Whereas, like they feel the need to merge it any further. Yeah, they, than, they, I, w- yeah. I, they will never do it because you yeah. look at what Microsoft did with the Surface was like, let's make a crummy laptop that's also a bad tablet, you know? So <laughs> yeah. that yeah. it took a while. My first review of the Surface RT, which was the one that was powered by an ARM processor. So it was oh, Windows yeah. on it was ARM so in like bad. 2012. And I just wanted to throw that thing at the window. It was so terrible. They got better. And I think the design of the Surface laptop, uh, like tablets, is kind of amazing. Like the amount of power they can get to that thing being so thin, but they drop the ball in software because Windows just sucks. And what's what's a, great is yeah. is that there are apps that it works really really well with. So I use I use a Surface for using some control apps yeah. because those control apps you can build them. Like there's a program. I don't use the Surface necessarily for this, but I I use this program. We use this program for office hours to run our show called Universe. And uh, it's out of Germany and it lets you just design your interfaces. Um, and, and so you can design all these interfaces that you want and a surface happens to be it, it's PC only and the surface happens to be a great, now you can publish it to other things through web pages and so on and so forth. But the surface is a great interface for that, you know? And so when you build something out, that's going to control that, that's piece that, that runs on a PC and you build the interface out. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that we haven't done enough of is building mission we have generalized interfaces and that's where we've been for a long time um, where when you start working with touch uh, screens, you start realizing that you could design the interface for the mission every single time. I move the buttons to where, you know, uh, I move the buttons to where I want them. I, there's a program called Mimo Live, which is what I use for the Michael Krasny show and the gray matter dot show. And, and uh, I can design the interface. And so I have all the edits that I want to do with the lower thirds and the graphics and the start, live stream and live stream start records all those things but i built a nice little picture of it <laughs> now i just tap on buttons i mean and i'm not trying yeah. to remember what what thing to click on or where to click it i just tap on the big buttons that i that i created and if i don't like them i switch to edit mode move them a little bit mm-hmm. turn go back to show mode and go back to what i'm doing and i think that that's where the surface those we don't see enough of those i think mm-hmm. people aren't building enough apps like that where I'm going to design the interface because that's what touch really wants you to right. do. Like right. you, you want to have it there. It's uh, I mean, listen uh, for that use and the football coaches, right? Like surfaces, great, great computers, I guess. And I, I was, you know, a lot of times they threw the, the first couple of years, man. there was all these clips yeah. of them throwing their surface yes, around. Because that's um, what I did in my know. reviews. Like I just want to get this thing out of my face. Uh, anyway, we well, will be it's yeah. going to have a dedicated co-pilot key is the uh, is the rumor. Yes. And I think and that'll I, be I've as, reviewed a couple laptops that have those. It's fine. It's it'll, totally fine. A, yeah. It'll age as well as the pizza key that was on the original I dot open, I think is the uh, <laughs> that would summon Domino's pizza for you. I, uh, I mean, I could I could use a pizza. Button, uh, so I mean, when you think about the useful, well, I don't know why when you said the NFL thing, I, think about how AI could affect NFL where the, yes. the, the quarterback gets off the thing and it just a ton of data all comes to, you know, this guy twitches his leg every time he's going to blitz, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, like we just noticed that you might want to, that would be cool. look at that. that would be, I, I do. I'm also interested be, in seeing where AI it goes. Be Go ahead. Really interesting to see where AI speaking of when you mentioned uh, the ability to change interfaces. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm really interested down the road when AI has the ability to, uh, 
ch- dynamically change your interface on the yep. fly. I mean, that, that oh, could man. that could create a little bit of that like, sounds like maddening. Scott, yeah, it sounds mad. Think, that. Although, you know, well, what? All, my, all my phone apps, all my phone apps on on my front page are the uh-huh. Siri suggested ones. Right. So my front page on my phone is never the same grid of apps. Oh, I'm, I hate uh, that. I, would never I love it. I love Good it because God. it's like I just I'm like, like, I'm like ever changing. I'm living in an ever changing space that generally tends to serve me up stuff that <sighs> usually works. And so I've given up on any app placement or order, wow. but, um, you've but given into like madness to chaos. Well. You have to strike for control. I have. That's what I've swiping down the is for, Scott. When you swipe down, then yeah, you get the well, recommended apps for this particular time, yeah. you know? I do it for the whole page. And well, anyway, I think that there is, there's interest. It is insane, but they can always bring up the app grade if you get lost or, you know, check to that. Yeah. So oh yeah. I feel like there's interesting no, great. stuff it's that great. could be served up to you more and more to the mm-hmm. point where you, yes, you could have an exit mode if you lose it. But I, but I, I think there's opportunities there is what I'm saying. Like, I, I just I think feel a perfect like AI assistant yeah. who can do some of that stuff for you. Like, Hey, you got this meeting. Do you have all the things you said you would talk about before? Or like all prep, like, having that right. does it get is spammy like, is the dream and maybe maybe that would be good maybe that does make your lives better i don't know uh but yeah i'm sure twit will be talking about all this news i'll be covering in gadgets so keep an eye on that uh we're gonna have to wrap soon but i do want to rapid fire just a couple stories i think are fun you guys can respond at the end if you find it interesting uh we saw this week that the fcc raised the broadband minimum recommendations to 100 megabits per second down uh 20 megabits per second up up from 25 and 3 so now that is three was absurd, absurd, was ridiculous, yeah. insane. So and the people who have, voted against this should be ashamed of themselves. Like absolutely they, I, ashamed. Like it's, realistic broadband speeds. I think this is basic for everybody. Uh, but also, uh, if you are actually working from home, I hope you have gigabit because that is the only way to live. But really, I hope you have fiber I, and gigabit. Yeah. You know, we we did this with plumbing. We did this mm-hmm. with electricity. We did this with phone. We should be talking about fiber to the home. Like it's just another utility. Yep. It is fiber to everyone's house because then it's one gig now, 10 gigs, 40 gigs, 100 gigs, whatever it is. But we should be putting glass into every house the way we did other things. Like it, it, it's not that we can't do it. It's that we won't. We put glass in the windows. We could put glass to the curb. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. we could do, we could totally do that. 150 years apart. Yeah, Another exactly. quick mention, by the way, Pornhub says adios to Texas after Texas enacted, um, I basically, uh, their age verification law. That is the thing that's going to be moving forward, according to appeals court. Yeah. Ted so, Cruz, very disappointed. Yeah. You gotta Sorry, love it. That's, a, uh, that's a big callback to another story. <laughs> <laughs> but Pornhub is, is, says goodbye to Texas before Texas can ban it. So or, An interesting way to censor yeah. without censoring is to do, require something that you can't that no one's going to do. That's yeah, so exactly, an interesting exactly. take on that. Also, not, a smart what move. Do with it. not a smart move. I do want to shout out a really great profile that I read on the Financial Times, mm-hmm. by the way, of an Uber Cheats, uh, or the developer of Uber Cheats. Uh, this was an app that came out a couple of years ago, uh, developed by a worker, actually somebody who moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to work on uh, self-driving cars. And he became disillusioned with the whole idea because he was like, this actually won't help the environment and will help people. So he is doing like a bike safety startup now. Uh, the person's name is uh, uh, Armin Sami. So this is a really great profile called The Delivery Rider Who Took On His Faceless Boss. It talks about what he did to develop Uber Cheats, which was this tool that could let you see how the Uber Eats algorithm was screwing you over as a worker, where it would underpay you or not like track where you went effectively. Really useful thing. Um, I think this is a good piece. Also, there's an interesting stat in there that basically over a billion people now are working for an algorithmic boss. And that to me is mind blowing or working for some sort of service where they don't have a human to talk to their work. Everything is coming down through a machine to them. And for some people, that's a good thing. I'll tell you, there's a story that came out related to this just slightly, which was, uh, I think it's reason magazine got all up in arms because some new laws in my home city here of Mm -hmm. Seattle that require minimum, all kinds of minimums for gig workers so that they're, when they're idle, when they're not driving, whatever it said, it now costs $26 to get a latte delivered and $30 for McDonald's or whatever, whatever. And people, the commentary I saw was, well, that's what it costs for the living wage for the person mm-hmm. who is delivering it to actually make money to pay all their bills and pay for all their stuff that they have to bear as a gig worker. So the system is working correctly. The problem is it's the exposure of the actual cost of goods without grinding people into dust. That is what people are angry about. Oh my God, the cost, oh God. the terrible cost. It's driving. They're saying restaurants are going to, are losing business and so forth. Like, yes, because you are 
building the entire thing on the backs of workers who, mm -hmm. who are not mm -hmm. making a living. I saw this in the early days of like Uber and I, I was in a co-working space with a startup that was essentially doing like, you know, uh, quick gig delivery stuff. And it was the grossest thing in the world because the guy was just like, I could pay these people to do nothing to do to do just runs around the city and it would get them publicity. It would make them think like they're a real company, but it, there's no tech there. There's no tech there other than using human mules. So anyway, um, yeah, I think this is a really the, good um, profile. It, mm -hmm. It's the mechanical Turk. It's like to me, it's like the illusion of instantaneity that mm -hmm. we want to put into physical goods that it, reading that story disturbed me because not only. Do you lose track of that? Or I, do I lose track of that when I think about ordering things? But also the, the inability to petition um, when things are incorrect. And, oh you know, gosh. like with, with, with A.A. Boston, yes. all the things that they were struggling with um, is a pure nightmare. And so well, there's like, one example there, like uh, there are deliveries being made to this McDonald's, which doesn't exist. And there was no right. mechanism within the app, within the app or even the Uber Eats like structure yeah. to say hey this thing doesn't exist stop this so we can deliver better service to people um just didn't exist because he didn't really have a human to talk to anyway good piece i want to wrap this episode by diving into what's good in pop culture for all of us and scott you got my mind racing yesterday because you were saying you were watching the taylor swift concert um film on the vision pro and how much you wanted it to be an immersive video experience rather than just a flat 2d experience can you talk more about that yeah, I'm not a Taylor Swift fan, but I do start, I am starting to work out to her music in Supernatural. So <laughs> I am appreciating it. But, um, but I, but I do, I was curious about the concert and I only watched like a handful of minutes of it, but it, it kind of was interesting. I need to write about this because it threw me into a flip side thing, which was like the problem with watching anything in the headset is that you're kind of creating the illusion of an experience of that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm watching the illusion of a movie I'm watching or I'm, you know, you're creating a frame for things like doesn't need to be that. So if you're watching a concert and it's now in film form, like my TV is a TV. And I thought, you know, it's showing up that way because it, it needs to show up that way. But if I'm watching this, obviously it's shot to be a film, um, but it just feels weird because I'm distanced from it on Vision Pro. Mm -hmm. It's very nice, very immersive, but I obviously want it to be the immersive video format where I feel like I'm really at the concert. Or what is it? You know, now I'm like more aware that I'm watching a film about Taylor Swift. Right, right. I didn't feel, whereas on a TV, I may be more feeling like I'm at, I'm at the concert. So I think that's something that needs to be resolved by anyone oh. designing immersive stuff. Disney's not technically doing that here, but it was just as the big thought where I thought like, what, what am I using the headset for in that regard? Well, and it brings up a whole bunch of questions. This is what I work on. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, yeah. uh, yeah. so there's a couple of things. One is, do you need more than one camera or do you want to have the experience? What I find is when you start cutting, it just, it turned your brain goes to, this is a film. And when you do 24 frames a second, this frame, this is a film. When you right. stop cutting, and you start increasing the resolution and the frame rate, it starts to become a window. So at 120 frames per second, 4K per eye or 8K per eye, um, it's an entire, like you are there, yes. you know? And so, and so, and then what happens is you start cutting, people start getting sick because their brain is no longer referring to this as a film. It's referring to it as a reality and their inner ear and, and their eyes don't match up. And that usually means that they were poisoned for a million years. And so the, um, and so the, uh, so it is a complete, so what we're going to see is I think an entirely different kind of filmmaking where we actually go to much, I mean, like for live events, we find that this is, this immersive experience is great for live events. Did you see the, have you seen the Alicia Keys? It's amazing. Yes. Yeah. 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 For me, the only, my only complaint there was cutting it all. Like I'm fine yes. with just sitting next to Alicia Keys and having her sing to me, you know, where she's looking over and, and singing and playing and doing just naturally looking at me. I would have been much more happy with that without moving around at all because that didn't feel natural. It immediately went back to a film. Yeah. There, there were four we, cameras in different corners and the, it would have cut between They looked them like little speakers. Yeah. Right? But they yeah. were really- It's the same what, feeling I have yeah. riding Soren at, I just came from Disney. So like, you know, <laughs> the Soren ride, it's so strange to me that it's so immersive and yet you're cutting between different locations. Mm. And, and then yeah, I go, and, what, what what was that about? But it's the same thing. Like you're, you're, you're really in the place, but you're also cutting. So and, and, there's something and, that needs to be resolved. And we've, we've been doing a lot of research in that area. And we find that if you get the frame, if you get the the height just right of the camera and you get what they're, you know, so it feels natural and you stop cutting, what happens is at first you feel slow and then you just get into it and you're just there. Like mm -hmm. you're immersive. And even, I, even the stuff that Apple's doing right now with, as their examples aren't doing that. They're cutting, as you said, and that takes yeah. you out of it immediately. It just pulls you out of that, out of that experience. And so I think that we're going to see more 
uh, more experimentation in that area. But a lot of us have been thinking about that a lot of these productions may turn into one camera productions or something that the user says, I want to, like I would want to walk over there. I want to sit above behind the drummer or I want to sit somewhere. And it be, does become something that there's a couple feeds available to them that they can go and sit, but it, it's really their experience of it. And if they leave it alone, they're going to sit. The problem we get into is that a lot of people th think the artists need, need uh, the audience. They don't. Most of them don't. Um, they don't really see the audience after a thousand people anyway. Um, but really where the camera wants to be is about 10 feet away at about chest height. And if you put, put that camera there, it, everything, you get the full 3D experience and everything else. And it's a, it's a great, you know, we, yeah. uh, you, I think you'll see more of that as we start to move forward. But I think the Taylor Swift thing proved at least that people want to go see a show. Could you do yeah, constructed people, drone footage yeah. where you'd have, be able to pull out, have people so, like almost calculated positions or is that going to make everyone drones sick? Drones make people that? at a high frame rate. Well, oh, especially in, yeah. in you know, moving cameras in VR is something you have to be very careful about and generally can't do very much of because especially when people have a, a high performing inner ear. So I have a low performing inner ear, so I can watch anything. But if you have a high performing inner ear, you'll get sick really fast with any motion. And so um, the, uh, yeah. and so uh, the, so the, the issue is you really can't start when you go into IMAX is the same challenge. When you go into anything well, that where you can't see the edges of the screen. So as soon as you can't see the edges of the screen, that becomes this prob problem okay. of, of what you're doing. Cause you don't have a reference point um, to it. Right. And so, but I think that, again, film can stay at 24, and I think there's a reason for that. Yeah. It tells you, and you can watch yeah. it without getting sick, and you can do all those other things. But these immersive experiences, sports, um, music, those types of things, I think you're going to see going towards higher frame rate, the 180 degree, especially for the headset. Mm -hmm. They have That's to like be vignetting in VR games that begins mm -hmm. to uh, narrow your thing to, you know, oh, for yeah. the same reason. But uh, cool. I just want to let people know as a comfort thing that, you know, uh, you know watch the Taylor Swift you know, concert, enjoy it. Don't feel any FOMO about not seeing an Envision Pro because even though the screen looks great, it's not, it, in some ways it throws me out of the experience. You know, I, I totally it's, feel um, that. Yeah. Yeah. Watching normal videos in Vision Pro can be good, but it's also like very much like, oh, this is a weird virtual environment I'm in. Uh, have you Glenn, seen the, um, the, have you seen the, the app from uh, uh, Adam, um, the person behind Sandwich Video, I'm blanking on his last name suddenly. Hmm. Um, uh, it's an app called TV for Vision Pro, yeah. and it lets you use classic televisions in order it's to really frame. Cool it's That's very amazing. interesting. That's a Why really am I forgetting his last name? You know, uh, Adam Lizagor, Adam Lizagor. We've seen him in many, many ads that have been made by his companies. Awesome. Len, you put in a couple of things you want to talk about pop culture wise. Uh, why don't you go ahead and shout oh, those out? Yeah, these are fresh, fresh hot takes. Uh, Apple TV Plus has a series called Constellation, which I'd seen early reviews of. And it kind of talked about it being very slow and kind of maybe too slow. I'm, I think it's six episodes are out as we record this. And uh, I think it's amazing. It's got mm -hmm. uh, uh, Naomi uh, Rapace. I think Naomi I remember. Rapace, yeah. Rapace, thank you. Who is a uh, you know, terrific actress and um, just an amazing cast. And uh it's a contemplative space horror film <laughs> or series rather. And it's very slow. And I read one description that said, if you conceive of this as a movie about the strong relationship of a mother and a daughter or a TV series rather, then it reframes it. So it's, mm -hmm. it is a sci-fi show. It's deeply sci-fi. There's some great elements in it where I'm like, wow, it really feels like they're in the ISS. Like they, the mm -hmm. nature, the floating, the scene, you know, like I've seen pictures of it. I've studied it. I've written about, aspects of the ISS professionally I'm like feels like they really nailed it and just the experience of being an astronaut which the main characters are what the main character is um and it's there is kind of a central mystery that gets exposed exposed sort of I feel like early on and it, it's not a once you understand it, which you can understand even in the first episode, you see glimmerings or maybe have sort of cracked the mystery. It doesn't matter. So it is slow. It is very, it, you know, it is a sort of a Swedish, it's um, the main character is supposed to be Swedish and some of it's filmed in different parts of Scandinavia and Germany, Northern Germany. Uh, so it does have that sense of being maybe a little plotting, a little methodical, but I think it's kind of gorgeous to watch something that's filmed and acted, scripted so beautifully and there, there are horror elements, but there's also incredible emotional components. So I, I've really been enjoying that. And I'm glad I got awesome. over the reviews that were like, maybe it's too slow. I'm like, yeah, but not everything has to be fast. Some things are too slow. 
Um, and it then seems like uh, a really good concept from what I saw. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's a, it's beautiful and interesting in a lot of ways. And it's all about like everything is these days, it's about the nature of identity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The cosmic horror catnip thing oh is God, working for stuff. me. I've not seen it yet, but when I saw the trailers, I have no one else in the family wants to see it with me. So I'm going to see it alone, but um, is, maybe that's the best so, way to see it. It's so good. I just, um, it's just painfully good to watch so you kind of moments where they're like all right they're walking across a frozen lake again i'm like all right i can deal with that because it's part of the scene um the other thing is very different pace which is that on amazon prime invincible the second half of the second season which is heavily delayed through i don't know production whatever it's finally out they started airing episodes from that uh, i when the series was about to premiere someone put me onto the comic books which i had not read and they are amazing and sort of groundbreaking and interesting different take on su superhero uh, mythology and and again it's about mothers and fathers and children it's not just you know it's the usual thing it's about relationships that are presented on this big uh, uh, backdrop and uh, the TV series is I think pretty fantastic season two has been good uh, and this latest episode was it starts off and I'm just it's almost like heart punches it's so emotionally strong for a show that's very bloody a lot of punching goes on and a lot of technology mumbo jumbo and scientific yeah. mumbo jumbo and it still has incredible emotional feel in the show like it's, it's very violent like it's, it's crazy very I, violent I, I've seen the entire second half of this season, by the way. It, it, it's it's good. I don't think it's like as good as the first season, but it's definitely worth mm. watching. So thank you for shouting that out, uh, Glenn. I do want to say, I had this realization watching this. Um, I, th I think Invincible is basically just Dragon Ball Z. And I need to say it. Because it's Hilarious. literally about somebody on Earth who has learned from an alien civilization. Oh, you were here. That's, you were supposed to take over Earth. That, that was your plan. And then oh, no. now he has to fight the alien civilization full of super powered, you know, superhumans. Like it's, it's all Dragon Ball Z. So I, I like Invincible, but I, it's not as groundbreaking as I thought it was initially. Maybe it is uh, among American comics, but it's Dragon That's Ball Z. I've never read Dragon Ball Z. My kids were into it at one point. So I've missed the whole, and, and like Robert Kirkman's done other things since then, uh -huh. but it, it's, uh, uh, there's a whole interesting history of the comic too, but I wonder how many times that criticism has been raised. And I, I was I've totally not heard unaware anybody make that realization, but it is essentially <laughs> the basic setup of Dragon Ball Z. I find that hilarious. I've, uh, I've Alex never is seen there. Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, oh man. Th now's well, the time. Now's the time. R.P. Akira Toriyama. He passed way recently yes uh, i'm wearing a chrono trigger shirt now he I designed the characters that. for that yeah so our rip dude is a genius just seeing the entire world like mo mourn his loss is, yeah. is incredible alex was there anything you want to shout out oh yeah one one note that if you haven't seen uh the new me uh rapace version of the girl with the dragon tattoo in that mm, whole it's series it's good it's all in swedish uh and it is 10 times better than the american version like it is oh, so i've good. heard that <laughs> So good, like uh, you know, and and it is just it's it's hard to watch in parts. Like it's it's you mm -hmm. know pretty pretty rough, but it is an ama It's a much better version than what we saw that had a lot more money. It had a lot less money to spend, and it did it. It was really a TV well. movie, basically. So yeah, it was yeah. really really well done. Um, yeah. so this randomly showed up on my YouTube of a couple of days ago. I guess it's only like seven days old. Um, there is a uh, there's an a conversation. It's not really an interview between Alex Lifeson and Getty Lee. Getty Lee has a new book out. Um, yeah. And uh, I didn't know anything about the book. I didn't know anything about this. It just showed up on my, you know, it showed up on my YouTube or whatever. And it is the most wonderful conversation between two old friends that oh. I've seen on YouTube. And I don't know how long. And I'm, I'm a reasonable Rush fan. Like I grew up, I saw Rush a bunch of times when I was a kid. I don't really think about them that often. I, it might go months before I listen to them again. It's not like I'm a huge, you know, Rush fan. Um, but they're, I've always thought that it's, it's a very sweet band. You're a Canadian, you know? It's a very sweet like, band. Like they they talk about, they have this story where they tore apart the hotel, but then they came back and apologized the next day. <laughs> Led Zeppelin would never do that. Yeah, like, 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 they, like, like sweet, Alex, yeah. Alex tore, tears apart. They tell a story where he tears sweet. apart the hotel and then he comes back and shake, shook every person's hand, apologized to every person in the hotel Aww. for what he did the day before. So, um, so very, very Canadian. Um, but, but the, which they, they mentioned, but just such a, um, so many just great it, there's a comfort to the two of them talking because they've they've been in this band together since they were 13 years old and um so for 50 years they've been doing this together over 50 years and they just they still love each other you can tell and they just have this great conversation if you just want to spend an hour it's all feel good just having fun watching something about two bandmates it's just worth it, even if you don't know who Rush is. Like awesome. I know that, you know, but but it's just really just an amazing video. I found myself, I skipped through it 
saw like five minutes of them talking and I was like, oh, I'm going to go get a drink. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm going to pull it back and we're just going to watch the whole thing because it was, oh, and it was worth it. Worth this it. is the beauty of like random YouTube content. I think yeah. like just stumbling <laughs> into these things. Um, yeah. There is a great rush uh, use in the movie, the iron claw. Tom Sawyer pops up for an extended I'm sequence. Sure. And it's just <laughs> so <laughs> perfect. Such an incredibly sad and disturbing movie, yeah. but great use of rush in that. Uh, I would just want to quickly shout out. Uh, we, we are on a good run for TV right now. Uh, Guy Ritchie's is a gentleman. The TV adaptation oh, yeah. of his movie from a couple of years ago is a ton of fun. I didn't like the movie very much, but I love classic guy Richie. And if you miss like cool, swaggering British gangster dudes, uh, you know, uh, super cool brunettes who are, you know, are just so tough and smart. It is all the stuff that was in Lock, Sock and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch and his earlier films. And it is just that kind of remixed, kind of modernized, but a ton of fun. Super watchable. That's on Netflix now. I totally recommend it. Also, Shogun. This is not in the in the oh, notes, yeah. but Ooh, Shogun on Hulu is an adaptation that. of the book that's been in the works for over a decade now. It is incredible. It is. I, I'd never cared about Shogun, the book or the original miniseries, but this new one is, it feels very much like Game of Thrones. It is very politically, um, you, you know, just dense. The characters are really strong, incredibly well acted, including by uh, Hiroyuki Sanada, who is an actor I've always loved and has never really had Amazing. much chance to shine um, on American movies or TV. So he's great here. It's an American production, but it's mostly in Japanese. So it's kind of wild that this thing exists in this form. Incredibly good. A great watch, wonderful television. It looks beautiful. The actors are great. I think it's just like it's like being told a very good story. It feels like watching the early seasons of Game of Thrones, you know. So yeah, check that out, everybody. You guys sound interested, so yeah, check it out. Oh Shogun yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent, awesome. Hulu. So I, th I think we can wind it down for tonight. Thank you guys all so much for joining us. Like I, I knew this discussion would be fun, and we went off on a lot of tangents, but. I love letting those play because that is where we have the most fun as a conversation. Um, but I'd love to know, where can we find you all online these days? Glenn Fleischman, where can we find you? Well, you can find me at, uh, at Glenn. Sorry, I have to look at my own, uh, my own, but it's a Glenn dot fun is an easy way to get to me with Aww. two ends, but uh, I've got a Kickstarter project underway for a book about comics, history, newspaper, comic production, history at how, Excuse me, how comics were made. Ink. Ink, and it's a book about uh, with all kinds of untold stories and never before seen objects and beautiful weird things like flong, which I talk about regularly <laughs> this week in tech, old tech, old tech and new tech. Oh man, that's a whole other show. Old tech, I love old tech. Scott Skine, where can we find you? I don't know. You could just try to like look in the clouds and try to find. Yeah, we'll find Scott find muttering me. on the social networks. Yeah, just find him muttering on the bench of social media. So um, you could find me. Uh, uh, you could find me on Threads. You could find me um, on Blue Sky or Mass and Remind me to post on there. You could mm -hmm. um, try to see whatever I've done on TikTok, which is nothing really. Um, you could find me on CNET. You could find me um, also still on Twitter, but help me move to a place that I can be somewhere. Carry me with you and let's build- Come to Blue Sky, um, Scott. Let's just keep the yeah. weirdness going. Let's do yeah. that and let's build a little Discord group and let's figure mm. out like a park bench where we can live. So those are the places and I wish you luck finding me. <laughs> awesome. Alex Lindsay, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me every morning uh, from uh, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. I'm doing Office Hours Global. You can go to officehours.global to see what the website looks like. It has a bunch of stuff there. Uh, but you can also just go to YouTube and search for Office Hours Global. We we talk and all we do, we get up every morning and we just answer questions. So you have to put questions in. Um, and uh, we just sit, a bunch of my friends and I sit around and we just answer questions for two hours. And then we go, okay, we're going back to work. I so um, yeah. so yeah. that's pretty much the, that's all we do. We do it seven days a week. We don't broadcast Sunday so we can talk amongst ourselves about what we like and don't like about what we're doing. Um, but but the other six days are are on YouTube and you can see them there. Um, we're going to NAB. If you haven't heard of NAB, it's National Association of Broadcasters. We're going to be covering. We've got a booth. Um, if you want to go to NAB, because you get a booth, you get a code. So I'll give it oh. to you. It's the MP07. If you go to NAB and you sign up for the Expo Pass and you put in MP07, it's free. Can so anyway, so, um, so, so there you go. So Whoa. so anyway, so you can go to the Expo <laughs> for free with that code. Um, but the... Uh, uh, but if you want to watch it, uh, we'll be cover we'll be broadcasting live somewhere between three and six hours a day, um, and we've got wireless rigs and uh, nice. you know a bunch of stuff, um, you know a lot of a lot of crazy stuff that we're going to be doing. So we'll be covering it on at Office Hours Global. 
Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, you guys can find me at Engadget. I review all sorts of stuff. I write about stuff. I co-host podcasts there. You can also find me on Twitter and Mastodon and Blue Sky at at Devendra on all of those places. I'm on threads, but don't message me there because I hate it. Um, also podcast about movies and TV at the Filmcast at thefilmcast.com. And if you liked our pop culture discussions here, you'll find more of that there. Thank you all so much for joining us. Another twit is in the can. Amazing.